Good evening. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Arlington Select Board for Monday, March 7th, 2022. This is Select Board Chair Steve DeCourcy. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Diane Mahan? Affirmative. John Hurd? Yes. Len Diggins? Here. Eric Hellman? Yes. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Adam Chapdelaine? Yes. Doug Heim? Yes. And Board Administrator Ashley Maher is participating remotely. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act signed into law on February 15th, 2022, that extends certain COVID-19 related measures. The act includes an extension until July 15th, 2022, of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. The governor's order, which is referenced with agenda materials on the town's website for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Before we begin, permit me to offer a few notes. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom, is being recorded, and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to, wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment, and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus Agenda platform. Finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. Our meeting this evening includes eight Warren article hearings. Let's see how much of the town's business we can get done tonight. Before we begin, I um, just want to let the public know that we attempted to have tonight's meeting in the select board chambers. Um, unfortunately, there were some technical issues at town hall that ACMI has been working on. And uh, we are hopeful that we are going to have our March 21st meeting in the select board chambers, at least with the members and staff. Um, we may um, have a hybrid type meeting uh, and allow participation through Zoom and, and, and through Collins, but uh, stay tuned for that. But it looks like we will be back on March 21st. And with that, I will turn to the next item on the agenda, which is a statement from the town manager, Mr. Chapdelaine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the members of the board. As individual board members are aware, and as was reported last week in local media, tonight, I'm officially announcing my decision to leave the role of town manager effective June 17th. 10 years serving as town manager and two years before that serving as the deputy town manager has been a tremendous honor. However, after a great deal of consideration, I've decided that I need an opportunity to reflect, recharge and refocus as I consider what to do next in my career. As we all know, the past few years have been very challenging, but they have also provided perspective. Perspective that has shown me that nothing is promised and that the time we have here is to be cherished. Perspective that has shown me that my children will only be young once. And perspective that has shown me that while the work we do is vitally important, it doesn't need to be our identity. I'll be forever grateful for the opportunity here in Arlington, and I'll be forever proud of what we've accomplished as a team. I'm grateful to the board for the faith and trust that it has put in me. And I am thankful to the team of town employees that always rise to the moment. I'll always appreciate and cherish the support that I've been granted by town residents and volunteers. Arlington is a tremendous community. It has been a wonderful place to work. And I will be forever grateful for the opportunity that it has given me 
to build my professional skills while working on an array of important issues. I look forward to working to help facilitate a successful and safe town meeting this spring, working to see the FY 2023 budget adopted and helping the board to build a transition plan. From the bottom of my heart, thank you to everyone for making Arlington such a wonderful town. It will always hold a special place in my heart. Thank you for the time to give this statement tonight, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chapdelaine. And, and we will certainly have more to say as a board as we approach June 17th and in, in the uh, end of your time here as town manager. And as you said, it's been 10 years um, and the, the town manager had informed us last week there is a period of time, a, a notice period um, within his contract. It's a, it's a 90 day period. And so he has given us the 90 days, more than 90 days, um, announcing that he'll be leaving on June 17th. And we wanna thank him for his work. And as I said, we will we'll have much more to say as, as we go forward. And I appreciate the comments this evening. Um, okay, we will now go to item three on the agenda a request for increase of funds to private way repair revolving fund. Sandy Pooler, deputy town manager. Let me just promote Sandy. Here he comes. Good evening, Mr. Puller. Well, Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, Adam and Doug. Um, the town uh, has a private way repair revolving fund. In the process under which we allow citizens to repair private ways um, as a group, they petition the town for a process under which uh, they get permission from the select board for repair. Um, <clears throat> if a majority of uh, residents on a tent, on a street uh, vote to have their street repaired, they can then select a um, contractor from a list that our engineering department provides. We then collect fees from all those residents to pay the contractors. That fee goes through this revolving fund. And what has happened is over the years, the revolving fund um, has worked well. Uh, people have paid uh, the contractors through the assessments uh, for those improvements. But most of those repairs have been on smaller roads. This last year, we did a major repair for uh, Mount Gilboa Street and that repair cost $221,000. Uh, because it was so expensive, it's exceeding the limit the town meeting voted for this revolving fund of $200,000. And for those of you at home, just to explain, revolving funds can spend as much money as they take in up to uh, an amount set by town meeting. If during the middle of the year, looks like we're going to exceed that limit, both the select board and the finance committee can vote to increase that limit. So I'm here tonight. Uh, Adam, Ida Cody may be here too, I'm not sure, uh, to ask the board's vote to raise the limit on the fund from 200 to $275,000 for FY22. Um, and with that, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Pooler. Uh, and I'll turn to the board, uh, Mr. Diggins. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I mean, so I would like to move uh, approval um, and, and uh, allow for us to uh, increase the uh, monies allotted to um, $275,000. And um, I, have, I do have a, a couple of questions. You know, so um, the, the source of the funds, Mr. Um, Mr. Fuller? Um, most of the funds come from the residents themselves. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I mean, so where will we get the extra 75K? From uh, assessments from the residents. People are paying into the fund, but they've hit the $200,000 limit. They'll pay in over that limit, but we can't spend over the 200,000. So we need you to 
raise the spending oh. limit so it meets what they're going to give us. Okay, I'm sorry. Well, I'm glad I asked that question because I thought I, my, my understanding was different in, in that I thought we needed to pay out more. I see it's more of a just kind of a technical adjustment. Gotcha. That's exactly okay. right. All right, fine, cool. Well, even even easier. I mean, not that I was going to have a problem with it, but but thank you for the clarification. I appreciate it. That's all, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Diggins, and good evening, Ms. Cody. Good evening. Um, I will now turn to Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. I second that. Uh, just a quick question for Mr. Pooler. Uh, so, uh, is there a, a downside to having a ceiling that's even higher? I mean, this is easy enough to do, but. Um, is there anything that affects our ratings or, or other financial practices that we wouldn't want to just set the ceiling quite high so that we have as much in case two or three large projects come, come at us in one year? That's an excellent question. It's one that uh, Comptroller Cody and I are looking into now because we do know that there's another $150,000 project that's coming up on the schedule for the following year. It is our intention to make a recommendation for the FY23 limit on this fund at town meeting. And we believe that we will make a recommendation at that time to raise it. Uh, we are just trying to decide at this point what the right number is. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to add, just add to the conversation briefly that the reason we need to increase the funding now, am I correct, that we need to pay the contractor um, and then uh, it's not, it's the town paying the contractor, but then the residents who ultimately are paying for this will be paying back in four or five years. So uh, the contractor naturally can't wait four or five years out or get four or five years worth of payment. We pay it up front, they pay, they pay it back over four or five years, it replenishes itself, so it's paid for by the private way residents. Did I say that briefly and correctly, Mr. Pooler? You said it briefly. You said it 90% correctly. If okay. I could just say one thing, some people make their payments right up front. They don't put it on their tax bills for five years. Other people do pay it over five years. So we have most of the money that we need. to. And, and, and the other important thing you said is we want to pay the contractor, that the contractor did the work, He's waiting to be paid. Uh, so I just want to be clear in this revolving fund, a lot of people just give us the money up front. Some people paid off over five years. Uh, that's the only technical addition, I'd say, to what you stated correctly. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Hurt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Happy to support this. And I would just say that after you know four or five years of people asking us to repair their private ways, I, it's just good to see that we've spread the word enough about the betterment process as this is the correct path to get private ways repaired. And we have seen an increase in applications, which is a good thing. It means people are using the avenues available to them to repair their private ways. So I think this is a good process that we're going through and I'm happy to see that we're gonna increase or we're gonna talk about increasing the limit to promote additional streets that need repair to use this process. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. And I'm also happy to support this. I actually heard from someone in that neighborhood uh, about two weeks ago, commenting on how well the program went and as to the scope is over 70 families. So it was a huge, undertaking, but uh, they, at least what was reported back to me, they were very happy with the process and I'm um, really pleased that the neighborhood was able to come together and, and uh, get, get the work done. So I'm happy to support it. Just a question, has the finance committee already voted on this or is that coming up at a future meeting? I believe that they will take it up tonight also. Okay, all right. Thank you, Mr. Pooler um, and, and, and Ms. Cody as well. Um, so in a motion by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Helmuth, Attorney Hine. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yeah. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes, thank you. Mr. Corsi? Yes. Mr. Anamis vote. Thank you both for joining us tonight. Thank you. Uh, next is the consent agenda. That is items four, five, and six. 
Item four, minutes of meeting, February 7th, 2022. Item five is a request for a contractor drain layer license, P. Gillespie, Inc. Uh, number six is for approval school bus monitors as special municipal employees. Uh, and on the consent agenda, uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I move approval. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Mahan? Second, no questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Hurd? No questions, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Diggins? Um, quick question through you, Mr. Chair, to, um, um, to our town council. Um, will they have to do ethics training at special municipal employees? They already do, sir. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Yep. They, they, just so folks know, uh, they have slightly different rules applied to special municipal employees that essentially allows you to have more than one job so that folks who are working for the public schools can also serve as a, uh, as a bus monitor, which is one of the main benefits of being a special municipal employee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. And I, I have no questions. So on a motion for approval by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mrs. Mahan, Attorney Hein. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Unanimous vote. Thank you. Uh, item seven, under appointments, Zoning Board of Appeals, Associate Member, Elaine Hoffman for a term to expire October 31st, 2024. I believe Ms. Hoffman is with us this evening. Yes, and she should be joining us right now. Great. And this is for the, the final open seat on the Zoning Board of Appeals. So we had filled a full seat and one of the associate members and, and Ms. Hoffman is, is uh, being recommended as the second associate member. Um, good, good evening, Ms. Hoffman. Hello, everyone. Hi. Um, thank you for joining us today. And just uh, for some members know, Mr. Hurd and I interviewed Ms. Hoffman last week. We had a great interview and uh, really looking forward to, to seeing her serve on the um, ZBA, if it, assuming we get the vote this evening. So. Ms. Hoffman, if you could uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, why you're interested in serving on the on the Zoning Board of Appeals. Absolutely. Um, I am Elaine Hoffman and a local architect with about a decade of experience in and around New England. Uh, as a certified passive house professional, as well as a lead accredited professional, my expertise is in sustainable design, particularly related to um, the operational energy and embodied carbon of both new and existing buildings. And given this professional background, I believe I would be an asset to the ZBA in reviewing applications and understanding the environmental implications of even small projects as relates to our zoning bylaws. So I appreciate the consideration of my appointment as an associate member to the board. Thank you very much. And I'll turn to the board, uh, Mr. Hurd. Sorry, a little unmuting trouble there. And good to meet you face to face, Ms. Hoffman. We had a phone interview, so it's always good to see somebody in person somewhat. Um, and as we talked about in your interview, you are very well qualified. I think you'll be a great fit for this position. So happy to recommend your appointment to the board. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I mean, um, yes, I mean, the qualifications are definitely there in, and, and your, your, your realm of, of study you know, um, or, or expertise is certainly what we need you know, um, going forward in an uh, environment where we really have to take care of um, the climate concerns, I mean, um, or at least work to mitigate them. And, um, there's something special about associate members. And, and so, uh, yeah, I really appreciate the fact that you are stepping into this role and I hope it's just the first step in your involvement with um, TBA. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Helmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, Ms. Hoffman for, for being willing to do this. I was thrilled when I looked at your resume. Um, the, as you probably know that the town is working really hard on looking at buildings for a sustainability plan. You know, a very large percentage of our carbon emissions uh, from our emissions come from buildings. And I think that your expertise will help uh, the coordinated effort that we're making with things like the net zero action plan, um, looking at, at um, a better stretch code 
to to really take a hard long look at the existing and new buildings that we that we are doing and how they fit into the climate change crisis so um, so thank you for your work and thank you for doing some of that for us thank you mr helmet uh, mrs mahan um thank you mr chair and thank you Ms. hoffman for um joining this important committee um Mr. Helmut pretty much encapsulated all the remarks that I, I would around climate change and net zero. Um, recognize we're talking about the Zoning Board of Appeals. So um, we have about four or five hats. I'm very appreciative for all those hats and uh, I look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Yeah, and I, I also am happy to, su to support um, the, the, the nomination and I wanna thank Ms. Hoffman um, we had a really good discussion last week. And, and one of the things that we've seen from some candidates for positions, and Ms. Hoffman has done this as well, she attended several ZBA meetings, saw what they were doing, wanted to become more involved, and then really, um, really appreciate that, that background work uh, before you even put your name in. And so I'm happy to support your nomination. Uh, so on a motion by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Diggins, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmer? Yes. Mrs. Vaughn? Yes, thank you. Mr. Quist? Yes. Unanimous vote. Congratulations. Thank you, and thank you all for those lovely comments. Sure. We look forward to working on the Thank you very much. Great. Uh, moving on, I'm going to call items eight and nine together, and eight is going to be a very brief Discussion item eight is coordination by Verizon of double pole removals. And uh, number nine is a public hearing for a Verizon petition on Massachusetts Avenue in Willow Court. Karen Levesque is the right of way manager from Verizon. And so while we wait for Ms. Levesque to come and join us, I, I put item eight on the agenda really as a means to um, follow up on an earlier meeting where um, we had received word from Verizon that they um, had indicated to actually to ACMI that they were current on all their double pull work. They were just waiting for other utility companies to get in touch with them. And uh, we wanted to set up a meeting, had a little bit of difficulty hearing back from them and receiving a commitment. But the town manager informs me today that he did um, confirm with Verizon that not only are they willing to attend the meeting, they had asked for available dates in the next week or two. And uh, I don't know if there's anything further further to add on that, Mr. Chapdelaine. Really nothing beyond what you just stated, Mr. Chairman. Um, my office will work to pull in Eversource, RCN, Comcast, as well as town staff to join that meeting with Verizon so that we can try to better coordinate forward progress on the removal of these double poles. Great, thank you. And then, and then this is to the coordination that, that just the companies communicating with each other. So that was, I didn't know how that was going to play out, but today we got good news on that. So unless board members have any questions on eight, I'll move right to, to number nine or, or comments. Okay, don't see any. So item nine is the Verizon petition. Um, and uh, if, if Ms. Levesque is with us. So I am not seeing Karen Levesque. Um, oh, Levesque, I'm sorry. Uh, I, that That's how Fall River people say it, but I, I, I don't know that that's right. Um, <laughs> um, if, if, if there's another representative from Verizon, perhaps they could raise their hand, but yeah, I, I, so it looks like someone named Bill Wallace is here who's raising their hand, so I'll promote them. Hello? Good evening, Mr. Wallace. Yes, I'm sorry about that. No problem. Yeah. Yeah, if you could tell us a little bit about the petition and I know you've submitted an application um, and then we will open it up to the board and the public if there are any questions. Okay, this is a petition for to run a new four inch conduit approximately 245 feet starting from an existing manhole 30 slash 25B with located on the northerly side of Massachusetts Ave for approximately 150 feet in the southeasterly direction, then turning northerly and heading in a northeasterly direction 
onto Willow Court for an additional 95 feet to an existing pole 715 slash one. Said pole being located on the easterly side of West Willow Court. This petition is necessary to improve the, the services in that area. Currently that area is fed through a conduit that goes underneath the building on, on Mass Ave. And it has become a very troublesome cable and um, Verizon through efforts to, to rod and rope in that current conduit is plugged. And it goes, like I said, it goes underneath the building. And so this would be a new route that would go into that area to feed not only the built, but that small strip mall that's on Mass Ave, but also the houses on Willow Court and in the back area there um, to repair that cable. Thank, thank you, Mr. Wallace. And, and for the public's benefit, Willow Court is, it, it, it meets Mass Ave across the street from the Whole Foods and abuts the First Baptist Church. Um, so I will now turn to the board, uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Move approval. Thank you, Mrs. No question. Martin. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hurd? Second. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Diggins? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I hope someday that I'll be able to, when I'm walking past some construction, map it to the select board meeting that we approved it. And I also want to say on point number eight, the, uh, I, I really appreciate the attention that we pay, that we give to trees. I mean, uh, on that one, we, we're going to do a walkthrough with the tree warden and to make sure that uh, the mature trees, the roots are are um, not damaged in, in this work. So it's just indication that we we do take our trees seriously. And um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins and Mr. Helmut. Thank you. No questions. Thank you, Mr. Helmut. Uh, this is a public hearing, uh, Mr. Chapter Lane. Are there any members of the public who wish to be heard on on this petition? There is one hand, um, Paul Chudigian. I'm probably saying that incorrectly, but I will promote them. Okay, he should be joining the meeting. Good evening, Mr. Chidigian. Here we go. I think I'm here. Yes, yeah, we can hear you. The question, is this conduit that will be installed on Willow Court? Oh, by the way, Paul Chidigian, Edgehill Road. I am also the building manager at First Baptist. Is this conduit going to be providing fiber to for Fios, or is this going to be used for 5G? I understand, I used to work in telecom, 23 years as a central ops technician that Verizon is looking to put an antenna on Willow Court. Is, and what will this be used for? Is one question, I, one more question after that. Sure, yeah, Mr. Wallace, could you? Um... I, I, at this time, I don't have any information on anything with 5G or, or, or anything like that. Uh, at this time, the job that's in the field is to replace the cable that goes underneath the building out of the manhole that's in front of um, that's in front of the building that runs alongside Ramsdale Court, between Ramsdale Court and Willow Court. Right. That cable goes underneath the building and arises on the very back of the building, which is troublesome. Right. I myself do not have any information about any further services beyond this. Right. Uh, um, I could look into it for you, but I don't have any information at this time. Yeah. Another, yeah, you know, this, my second question kind of piggybacks on the first one in that Verizon does not have any upgraded services along Mass Ave on the First Baptist side, going from First Baptist to at the Atwood House and the CVS Pharmacy. Uh, that has been a major problem for us at First Baptist trying to acquire high speed internet service and will also be a problem with the development of the Atwood House. Right now, the only service available is Verizon Legacy Copper, which Verizon is actively trying to decommission and retire. Uh, that's why I was curious as to whether or not this would 
uh, be eventually sold or open to the public and the abutters and extended maybe up Mass Ave where currently only Rising Copper exists. Nothing with Comcast, nothing with RCN, no service whatsoever. It, it sounds like that may be a different project. It, it, is that your understanding, Mr. Wallace? That's correct. I, I, I currently do not have any information on any further expansion of the files network or anything like that in Arlington at this time. Yeah, we uh, tried. Like and, yeah, yeah, we try and Verizon keeps saying no, and it's it's going to be a problem for as I said for the Atwood House eventual expansion because nothing's available up there. So that was my um, that was my concern for the uh, meeting. Okay, and, and and maybe we could pass that concern along too. I mean, you would like to, to see FiOS available to whoever wants it in town. Right. Too many exceptions and exemptions have been given by, uh, have been taken by the utility companies over the years, including RCN and Comcast, to expand into these areas where they can't get a fast ROI, and they just walk past it and say, "We will not give you any service." Sorry. All right. So we'll that as a separate issue, Mr. Chudigian, maybe we can follow up on that. Um, and it was a good, by the good. That's a good. That's, that's a correct percentage. My name. It's Chudigian. That's correct. Okay. I, I had a classmate named Chudigian that I don't like in high school. So I was Charlie, right? My brother Charlie. That's right. Exactly. Yep. So. Okay. Okay. That's all I had, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Is there anybody else? No other hands, sir. Okay, all right. Uh, so on a um, motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Hellman? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Corsi? Yes. Madam Spoke. Thank you. Uh, next item is item 10 outdoor restaurant and retail permit applications, Clay Dreams, 183 Mass Ave, Sugo. 162 Mass Ave and Trattoria Nina 1510 Mass Ave. Um, it's, I don't know if each of the applicants are with us or if there's anybody from uh, the planning department that may, may be with us on this tonight. I recognize at least one name from Sugo. I could promote Rudy and then ask the others to raise their hands if they're here to join us. Okay. It looks like we have three um, folks joining us, so I think we're covered. Okay, great. So if, if Rudy uh, is here, I think you just promoted him. Maybe we can hear from him first. Yep, he should be here. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, we, well, thank you. Yeah, if, if you and, could just... We have your application, but maybe if you could tell us a little bit about um, what your uh, the, the approval you're seeking for the outdoor permit. Uh, well, uh, last year we uh, got the two parking spaces in front of the restaurant, and I'd like to do that again. But this year I'd like to uh, make it a little bit more presentable. I was going to have a contractor, a local contractor actually, uh, build a collapsible deck for us with some planters make it look a little bit uh, uh, better than it did last year. The orange barricades were fine, uh, but I wanted to make it a little bit more presentable this year. And I didn't like it on the ground. And, mm -hmm. and uh, because I want to make it more even to the curb because the, the street slopes to the, to the curb a little bit. Okay. And... Uh, as we did last year with fresh greenery, uh, lights, and uh, keep it nice and clean, and uh, just make it appealing, and so people come and enjoy it, and enjoy a great meal with us, which some of you have already done. <laughs> That's right. Um, no, thank, thank you for that. So what it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each one of the applicants to tell us a little, and then we will go to the board for for questions and and, and possible motion, um, and. Uh, who else is with us, Mr. Chapter Lane? So we, we have Lorraine Frigoletto is with us as a panelist and Angelo Carbini is raising their hand and I'm, I'll just share them. I've, 
I'm promoting them to panelists, but they need to click to accept it on a message that should be coming up on their screen. Okay, all right. So we, yeah, if Ms. Frigoletto, she's here from Clay yeah. Dreams, and if she could tell us um, what uh, she is uh, asking for through the uh, application. Hi, I'm here. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm asking that um, that a parklet be made for with in front of my studio uh, um, with the parking space that's right in front of there. Last year we used it and we were able to have two tables set up for um, pottery painting outside, which was very helpful with um, parents with children that didn't want to come inside the building due to um, COVID. And they um, are really appreciate an opportunity to be not in an enclosed space, but outside in the air. So that's what I was asking for. Okay, thank, thank you. And the last, uh, Mr. Carbini. Is, is that right? Okay, yeah, okay. Good evening, Mr. Carbini. Yes, hi. Hi, yeah, and if you could just tell us a little bit about um, your petition for, for for the outdoor permit uh well i'm i'm happy as uh the previous uh year with the uh, with the uh, outdoor um, outdoor uh, uh seating uh, arrangement uh, so i have no no issues continuing like with the same uh, same setup uh except i brought this issue for the sidewalk the, the sidewalk uh, just outside the restaurant, uh, it needs repair, and I brought it up many, many times, and I send a, I send a letter once uh, through email, and I've never got a response. So I see that in Arlington they do other work in the in the uh, Arlington I am Center. The, I've seen through in the past year a lot, a lot of development improvement improvement as I work, but. The part of Arlington is, I see a little neglect. So I would like to know if it does I walk, uh, uh, I, what do I have to bring attention to, to have some, some kind of uh, fixing. Okay. If, okay. If maybe what we can do, Mr. Chaplain, maybe if we can follow up uh, through Mr. Rademacher on, on that issue with Mr. Carbini. So, um, so on the three petitions, I'll now turn to the board, um, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to, uh, move uh, approval of, of, of these um, requests. And, and also, I'd like to say that it's really good to see um, this expedited process um, working. Uh, Ms. Cotter uh, uh, was uh, the, one of the prime movers of, of doing this. I mean, I think she did a great job in guiding in the, the board to expedite the process. I mean, and and I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens with these parklets. I mean, as the chair knows, it, there has been an interesting study um, or or presentation by the Boston MPO, the Metropolitan Planning Organization, on the future of the curb, and, and there are some elements I mean, of that in what we're doing here. So it'll be really interesting to see how this plays out over the summer. So again, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. I uh, second that and uh, offer a friendly uh, minor amendment that would be suggest that we uh, approve subject to the conditions that are laid out in the memos from the uh, Department of Planning and uh, Community Development, the Spectral Services, and the Board of Health. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. And uh, I'll take that as a friendly amendment. And if that's okay with you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, yes, it, it, it sure is. And, and I guess that does bring up a little bit of a question that I had when. I was reading through because it wasn't clear to me if we still needed some approvals and um and where in the sequence we were. I mean, and so so I appreciate Mr. Holly pointing that out. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Yeah, no, definitely. I think there are additional steps that need to be taken before these go into place. So that the conditions will will take care of that. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. No question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Mahan. Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just like to say I'm happy to support this. I think the parklets have been a great success and glad to see them continuing this year in the years to come. And want to thank like my colleagues, the planning department for taking the lead on this. And I would just mention to these 
three applicants, which I, I don't think it will really apply for these applicants, but the only complaints that we get in some, with the parking, the Arlington Center Parking Committee is that sometimes the outdoor seating can cause trash buildup, not inside, not just inside the areas, but outside of the areas. So, so just be mindful if you have paper products that your patrons are using, if they blow out of the designated area, we would still expect that you to pick those up and make sure you keep the sidewalk clean. And I don't expect any issues with these applicants, but just something that I would say to anybody that was applying for the outdoor seating permits. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. And uh, I also support the petitions. Um, so on a motion that was made by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Helmuth, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Ma? Yes, thank you. Mr. Corsi? Yes. And Ms. Pope? Great. Good luck to, to all of you uh, with, the, with the outdoor seating this summer, the, the spring and summer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, I see Attorney Robert and SE has raised his hand. I'm not, was this a public hearing? I, I... This was not a public hearing. I believe he might be raising his hand for the Warren Sorry, article. Warren articles. Okay. Um, but this was not a public hearing for the license so. permit. So, uh, okay, uh, so we move on to item 11 for discussion for future select board meetings. And uh, right now, I believe all we have is the March 21st meeting. So we will have a meeting on April 4th for our organizational meeting. Um, and I believe we will need to... Um, if we don't finish on the 21st, I was thinking we add a meeting for March 23rd um, and hold March 28th out just in case. But I think it um, may make sense to, to have a follow-up because if we finish on the 23rd, that gives Attorney Heim some more time for the final votes and, and comments to get back to us. Um, and then I'm open on April. We have to have a meeting on April 4th for our, for our organizational meeting. And then there's a quest, town meeting starts on the 25th. So we'll have a meeting that night. Um, so to ask members if there's any dates that they wanna propose in April um, after the 4th and whether we need one before the 25th or not. Well, so I'm sorry, my connection I think was having a little bit of a problem with this chair. And so are you saying that we're gonna have a meeting on the 23rd of March? Yeah, I, I'd like to post the meeting. If we get done with all our Warren article hearings on the 21st, we won't have it, but we won't know until the end of that night. And so I'd rather post the meeting and cancel it than uh, have missed the time frame for, for that meeting. And, and my only concern is Attorney Hine needs some time to turn around comments and that gives him a little additional time prior to the April 4th meeting to do that. That's fine, as opposed to the 28th. So that's, that's fine. I, I was anticipating that we would um, do a meeting on the 28th, but I can certainly clear the decks for that Wednesday. And, um, and with respect to other meetings in April, I think, I mean, the, if we're going to do Mondays, I mean, the only Monday that would be available to us would be the 11th, because the 18th is going to be a holiday, I think. I think that's Patriot's Day. And um, uh, so, uh, you know, we want to the eleventh. I can do that, but I leave that to my colleagues. Yeah, I, I guess I'm going to say two things on that, and and I'm fine. I I am not available the week, or or on the eleventh. Um, but if the board members are happy to, uh, we can schedule a meeting that night. The only thing is we're we're meeting on the fourth, so I don't know how much new business we will have, a week later either. I mean, but but you're right. The eighteenth is a holiday, so. Um, you know, we can see where we are on the 4th. They would, we're definitely meeting on the 25th. That will be a shorter meeting because of town meeting starting that night. But uh, this, I don't know if board members have any other thoughts. If you'd like to do the 11th, fine, or, or, or propose the 20th. That would be the only other option. Mr. Mr. Diggins? So 
So are you, is it the 11th that you're not available? Um, yeah, I'm not available the 11th or, or the 13th of that week. So I, gotcha. I but I, I, again, if, if other members want to have the meeting, I'm not, don't, don't hold it up because of me. And, and it's not that I'm pushing for a meeting on the 11th. I'm just thinking about possibilities. So is the meeting on the 4th going to be like a full meeting or is it just in order to the organizational short meeting? No, no, it, it, it will be a full meeting. So that we will start with the organizational um, part of it and then the new chair will will have uh, put the agenda together. And, and so it's, it's whatever the chair really wants to do. Uh, Mr. Diggins, I'm asking you on that one, but uh, that then I'll work with you on putting that uh, agenda together. Okay. I'm getting ahead of myself, so I, I, I probably will work um, and, and uh, at, at least putting it together, but that historically the past few years has been a full meeting. Okay. All right. You know, so, okay. So, That's Chair, Thank you. I want to remind you, you still have to get reelected by the voters of Arlington. Right. Well, that's a good point, Mr. Hurt. So that's why I may, Beware not, of the writing I may not even be there on April 4th. Yeah. That's right. I don't want to get ahead of myself. <laughs> Um, Mr. Helmet? Yeah, I, maybe the 20th would make sense because, uh, you know, that would, as you say, if we just meet on the 11th, one, one week after we have a full meeting, may not be that much business, but there could be some stuff stacked up for us. If the 20th would work, it's a Wednesday, but then that would take some of the pressure off the short meeting on the Monday before select board. Okay. Is that acceptable to, to members? Okay. All right. So why don't, why don't we do that? And then we're going to be meeting through our town meeting. So what we will do is once town meeting starts, we'll, we'll meet at least every Monday um, through our town meeting. So I think, and, and we usually hold those meetings open um, from time to time. So we will maybe post April 25th and then the following Monday um, into, into May um, to do that. So, so let me just, and that would be May 2nd. So why don't we, we'll, we'll add the 23rd. April 4th, April 20th, April 25th, and let's say May 2nd, because we certainly will still be in, um, in town meeting at that point. And then we can see where we are at the end of May, at the end of May or beginning, or end of April, beginning of May. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mrs. Mahan. I I'm fine with that uh, schedule. I don't know that we'll need um, Wednesday, the 20th, because um, I'll, I'll just remind everyone that uh, our, as we all know, our town meetings, select board meetings, um, which we always start early at seven o'clock. Once we hit eight o'clock, if there's still business, the board continues, only the chair goes down to town meeting. Uh, it's happened on a very rare occasion that uh, the board has been at a select board meeting sometimes until after the break, 9, 30, 10 of town meeting. So, um, and again, that'll be between the outgoing and incoming chairs to sort of look ahead with the crystal ball on doing that. So I'm, I'm fine with any of those dates, uh, but I, I just want to remind uh, usually every two weeks, uh, especially with town meeting, we get the business done and we'll just see how the agendas go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Um, okay. Well, you yeah, know, what we can do is I, and, and maybe I can talk to the town manager. Um, we could go from the 4th to the 25th. I'll talk to the town manager and if we need to add a meeting on the 20th, there are a few things he wants to get done um, in, in late March and in, into April. If we need to add the 20th, let's hold that for now and um, we, can, we can see where we are on April 4th. So, okay, so we don't need a vote on this, but just for Ms. Myers' benefit. So we'll add the 23rd, we'll add the 4th, We'll add April 25th and we'll add May 2nd for now. Great. Okay. Um, so with that, I will now move on to the warrant article hearings. And as I said at the top of the meeting, there are eight warrant articles. Um, we had put these on and, and selected the dates before the actual warrant articles were assigned numbers. Um, and we have a draft warrant that is on the town meeting page now it will become final when we actually mail out the warrant and that will be later. Um, that, will, that will actually be in April. Um, so I will we'll go through this. I will, in addition to reading the warrant article, 
let people know in case they have pulled the draft warrant, what number it is in the draft warrant. So the first one tonight is an article bylaw amendment conversion of gas station dispensing pumps to self-service operation. This shows up as warrant article number 17 on the draft warrant. Um, and I believe that there may be a proponent who is with us tonight. Correct, Mr. Chair. I've invited to promote to panelists both the article proponent and attorney Anessi. Okay. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If you could uh, give your name for the for the record and uh, I guess for Nessie too. Sure. My name is Rashid Okuli. I'm the owner son of 125 Broadway Eli Service Station. Okay. And Mr. Nessie is with you as well. So if Correct. you could um, tell us about the uh, well, tell us about the article and what you're looking for town meeting and for us to um, take action on. Sure. So we are. Um, I wasn't sure if uh, Mr. Anessi wants to speak on my behalf as of right now, but um, we are looking to raise the um, self-service ban. Uh, I'm new to Arlington. I've been working there for about almost three years now. Um, it's been hard trying to find workers, especially with these couple of years, um, COVID and all that. Um, it's been really hard trying to find workers because of um, obviously because of COVID people don't want to go out and get sick and we have guys out there that are out there for countless hours throughout the day we have two gas attendants that are out there and they're standing out there for eight hours a day worrying about their health and people don't want to um these guys don't want to pump gas anymore so it's just been hard on us and um that's one of the main reasons we're trying to get this lifted because it is hard on us right um, Mr. Nessie, would you like to add anything? Yes, I'd love to uh, uh, say something as well. Uh, the, uh, of course, we know that uh, uh, the ability to pump your own gasoline has been prohibited in the town of Arlington since 1975. Uh, and Arlington is probably one of the last cities or towns, there are just very few, uh, that do not allow people to pump their own gas. Uh, and I think uh, that uh, a very good point was just made uh, with respect to uh, people pumping their own gas during the COVID times. A lot of folks did not want to have people to people contact uh, during COVID, uh, and they would have preferred to have the ability to pump their own gasoline. But in Arlington, they could not do that. Now, all of these surrounding communities, Belmont, Winchester, Lexington, certainly around Arlington, do have uh, uh, gas stations where there, uh, it, there is the ability to pump your own gasoline. I know that a lot of uh, issues are raised in prior discussions uh, uh, about going self-service, such as well, people might drive away and uh, they, the, uh, the pump would still be in the, uh, the, the car uh, apparatus of the car and all of that. I haven't heard any of that. Uh, there are also discussions in the past about fire issues. I haven't heard any of that either. We know we have a fire compression ordinance in the town that basically would require that a gas station that is going to have self-service have a canopy. The canopy would have a fire suppression system in it. And if in fact there ever was an issue, which again, I've never heard that this kind of thing has happened. If there ever was an issue, that fire suppression issue would kick in. Now, what's the, uh, the protection for the town with respect to going self-service? Uh, any gas station in town, in the town of Arlington, either exists because of a special permit or because it's non-conforming. Uh, if that's the case, and let's assume I've heard arguments in the past, well, if you allow self-service, that's going to bring about a situation where gas station operators are going to want to expand what they do. Well, they're not gonna be able to expand what they do without going before the ARB. Because uh, if you look at the zoning bylaw, the zoning bylaw requires 
that any gas station that is going to operate in the town uh, obtain a special permit. So if a, an existing gas station operator wanted to modify his or her gas station operation, they would have to go before the ARB and get permission from the ARB to do that. So that's the protection for the town. And again, I think that goes to the issue of what may have been raised in the past uh, about if you allow this, then you're going to allow uh, basically gas station uh, operators to have free reign. They're not gonna have free reign. All we're asking uh, is that gas station operators have the ability to have a choice. We're not asking that, uh, that uh, there be a mandate that every gas station in town has to have self-service. We know there's a bylaw that says you can't have more than three pumps, gasoline pumps in town. We know that. So we have limits, uh, but we're asking that you give the gas station operators and even the, uh, the people, the customers who frequent the gas stations, the choice and the ability to make their own decisions as to how they would like to operate. So we're respectfully uh, requesting that the board back uh, the article warrant that we're suggesting uh, for a town meeting uh, to allow the town to go from uh, just self-service gas stations to allow operators to have a self-service gas station. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ness. And um, I, before I turn to the board, and, and this, this concerns um, Title V, Article V to our town bylaws and uh, specifically restrictions on sale. And um, what the bylaw says right now is that no filling station shall allow the pumping of gasoline for retail sale by any person other than an authorized attendant employee of said filling station. And then the second section prohibits customers from pumping their own gas. It's two sections to the article. Um, so I'll turn to the board for questions, comments, see if the public has any comments, um, and then we'll see if we have a, uh, a recommendation. I'll start with Mr. Helmut. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll be very interested to hear what the members of the public have to say. I remember one of my first town meetings that I was as a member of this had come up a number of years ago and there was a spirited debate. Um, I also remember from that discussion also from our town council's excellent memo that was offered to us this week that one of the concerns that came up with potentially doing this is ensuring not, not only minimal compliance with state law that someone in theory could be available for a person with disability to pump their gas if a station decided to move to self-serve only, uh, but a way to really guarantee that. And uh, you know, I would be interested in hearing both uh, from the applicants, but especially through, through you, Mr. Chair, be interested in comments from the town manager or perhaps the town council and if there are approaches that we could codify that kind of requirement in, in a potential motion that would come before our town meeting. So um, would you like to hear from the town manager or, or turning home now on that point? Or, uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. And then maybe maybe if the applicants want to comment afterwards, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Yep, Mr. Chaplain. I don't know, either you or turning home. I mean, on on um, appropriate and clever ways to codify tricky matters, I would defer to the town council <laughs> if he has any uh, thoughts, you know, tonight or you know, or, or or how to think about to come up with a solution, I, I would defer to town council. Uh, may I say something? Well, why don't I turn to attorney Heim and then and I'll come back to you, Mr. Ines. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I think the the, the primary issue is whether or not the uh, ADA specifically uh, provides enough clear direction to gas station operators uh, in and of itself, just so the public can be clear on what's going on. The ADA does require certain things that refueling assistance from an attendant uh, can't come with a surcharge uh, for folks who are disabled, uh, that folks have to be advised through signage or some other mechanism uh, for how they can uh, notify someone that they need assistance in full service. Um, there's uh, also a requirement that that there is somebody available, although um, 
the they're not necessarily required to have such service available at every hour to my understanding um you know there are in theory lots of things that could be done uh to modify the existing requirement that there's no self-service uh gas uh operation uh, i'm not sure how into the weeds we want to get with respect to whether or not you know we have the ability to require um an attendant or certain types of signage some of those things though might fall under the zoning bylaw for example mm -hmm. um, mr nessie is correct that just uh, a note before uh, he speaks that the zoning uh by the, the special permits do set forth the number of permits um it's not 100 percent clear to me it may be possible that a special permit could um, also require certain um, accommodations be made available. Um, I'm not 100% sure about that, but that is that is also another way that it might be addressed through the special permit itself. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Attorney Heim. And Mr. Nessie, just before I get to you, I just want, uh, Attorney Heim brought up the zoning, uh, potential zoning issues. This, our recommendation will be before town meeting, favorable or, or unfavorable. The, I did have a meeting with the chair of the redevelopment board, and they would like to comment on this article. And that's that we, we had set up a structure where there may be certain articles where we may want to have comments. This is one where they will, but our motion and our action will be what is before town meeting. So uh, Mr. Helmuth had asked the applicant for comments too. So Mr. Nessie, if you want to add something uh, on this question, uh, go right ahead. I certainly would envision that there be an attendant uh, uh, at every gas station, despite the fact that it's self-service. And I certainly would not have any problem with having some sort of an accommodation for anyone with a disability so that the individual with the disability could have the ability to let the attendant in the station uh, know uh, that in fact they need assistance. Uh, and if that's something that uh, perhaps wants to be suggested by uh, the uh, members of the board or, or uh, any other town officials, I'm certainly open to recommending that to my client. Okay. I would Thank also like to add on, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, when it comes to the disabilities, we have a gas station that, that's in Revere. Um, there's a little bit, there's a lot of old um, elderly people there that have disabilities as well. Um, in order for them to alert the attendant that's inside, there is a button that is on our gas tanks that alerts the attendant that they need um, help and service at that, at that moment while the car is there. So just wanted to add that on as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I continue, Mr. Helmut, if you have any other questions. Yeah, thank you. No, I think I don't have any other questions at this time. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, Mrs. Mahan? Um, no questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And if I go off screen, screen, it's just one of my devices is getting low and I have to go run and get a charger. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't have any questions. I My concerns were similar to Mr. Helmuth, but I actually prefer self-serve gas stations. I like to just get out and do it and not wait for people and do it on my own time. So I personally, as a consumer, would be happy to have self-service, but is, I mean, I can support this as long as, and of course, we're just talking to the proponent who was one gas station in town. And we, I think as you go to town meeting, town meeting members are gonna to wanna to get some assurance or some set policy in place from all the gas stations in town or something, a consensus as to what we can require just to make sure that our elderly population or people with disabilities aren't just sitting there and aren't able to, you know, aren't able to not get gas as required. And certainly, I think on top of that is to make sure that there's no litmus test as to whether or not they qualify. You know, if somebody asks for an attendant to come help them with gas, then they should receive it without ha having to justify why they need it. But if that can be you know, satisfied to me, both as a select board member and a town meeting member, hopefully, um, I, I think I can support this. Like I said, I, I think, you know, to some people, self-service is actually more agreeable to just kind of bang in and bang out at your own pace. So 
Those are my only comments, Mr. Chair, no questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So you said that we're one of the last municipalities to um, not allow self-service. Uh, this would be um, to either uh, the uh, to the proponent or the or his uh, attorney, Mr. Chair. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Nancy, I, I, Mr. Nancy, I don't know if you want to comment. I, I believe, um, other than the state of New Jersey, that there's not that many um, locations that just require. New uh, Jersey is one of them. That's, that's for right. sure. The whole state. Yeah, the whole state. <laughs> but I thought I thought most municipalities in Massachusetts are allowing self service. I, I think that's true. I don't have any figures, Mr. Nessie. Do you have any figures? Or Years any ago, uh, I'm not sure what the case is now. Weymouth uh, did not allow self-service. Uh, I, quite frankly, Googled this uh, just this morning. And uh, my information is that most of the cities and towns in the Commonwealth allow self-service. Uh, uh, Wayne is still maybe a hold of, as far as I know. I wasn't able to confirm that one way or another. All right, thank you. I do have the, uh, another question, but I saw Attorney Heim raise his hand, so I, if it's okay with you, Mr. Chair, he, sure. he's no, he's, he's waiting. He's okay, I guess. Yeah, I've got it, Mr. Biggins. Okay, because my question was was uh, that was a preface to uh, trying to understand how do these other municipalities handle the access issue. Uh, that would be to let's let's go now. Sure. I see Mr. Heim's hand going up. Um, yeah, go ahead, Attorney Heim, if you like. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I do think that most of them address uh, it with newer technology on pumps and bays, as uh, the proponent is suggesting. I think the sort of real question mark is. Um, in terms of our special permits, since most of our uses are quite old. Uh, whether or not, let's say I have a station and I don't want to ask for any more pumps, uh, I have my three pumps and I'm content with what I have, do we have to go in and affirmatively amend some special permit to put in a requirement that there's a button or some mechanism to alert folks uh, who are in the need of a gas station attendant? So I think that's probably the biggest sort of question mark of is this is it going to be the same vehicle for every station? Because every station may not have modernized pump equipment. But that's my that, that's my belief as to mo how, how most of them comply with the ADA. There may be individualized additional requirements or, or local ordinances with respect to gas stations in different municipalities. Gotcha. So 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 this this article though isn't going to mandate that. All stations in town be self service. I mean, they have the option. So if they don't want to update equipment, they can remain full service. So, okay. All that's, right. the intent. that's the intent. Right. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. All right. I mean, well, I think not, I know where I'm headed on this, me, but as always, I wait to hear what the residents may have to say um, when we hear from them. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you, Mr. Diggins. And I, I don't have any questions at this time. Um, well, well, maybe one question, Mr. Cool, you mentioned that you will have somebody who would be available if, if someone needed uh, assistance. And you can see that is a concern of, of members of the board. Yep. And, and what does this do in terms of staffing? Does this allow you, if, if there is self-service, you, you have two attendants now and it would be sure. one attendant at the site? Yes, sir. Um, so another reason why we wanted to do this is because um, younger generation don't want to do any more like labor work and stuff like that. And we've been putting up signs saying that we do need help. And I've gotten anybody that's a, a retired veteran or retired person that just wants to make um, male, female that I could just put behind the counter. Everybody's been coming to us and asking for a job, but I don't want to put uh, a female outside at the pumps. I don't want to put an elderly person outside at the pumps to pump somebody's gas. So I'm trying to we're also trying to create job opportunities for other people. All right, um, thank you. So this is a public hearing. Uh, are there any members of the public who wish to be heard on this article? And if, if so, please signify by raising your hand and then Mr. Chapter Lane will uh, recognize you. And one hand raised right now, Ellen Cohen. Okay. 
he should be joining the meeting. Good evening, Ms. Cohen. Sorry, um, I'm just wondering if, as in other towns, there would be a discount with the self-serve and that's a current issue with the cost of gas. Question, yeah, Mr. Cooley, it, it sounds like you have stations in other communities. Is there a difference between what you're charging in Arlington because it's full serve versus uh, the self-service stations elsewhere? That I'm not too educated about. My father would know more about that okay. uh, at the moment. So that's all I have to say about that. Okay, all right. Um, anything else, Ms. Kona? No. Okay, thank you. Is, is there anybody else, Mr. Chaplain? Okay, all right. There, there's um, not. There's not. Okay, so I'll return to the board in the same order. I'm returning to Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. Uh, I I do not have strong feelings about this either way. I really, other than I think this deserves a, a much broader uh, consideration at town meeting. Um, is one of, one of the cases where a representative town meeting, 12 members from every precinct, can really take the temperature of their neighborhoods and really talk to the residents. And I think that you know this is a decision that needs to be driven by what residents want. Although I, I appreciate. Um, the concerns of the small business that um, uh, for these for these stations, and I think that's a voice that needs to be heard. Um, and I'm also going to defer, even though I'm, I'm usually inclined to make a motion. I think I want to hear what my other colleagues have to say and invite one of them to make an appropriate motion as I consider uh, consider keep, keep thinking about this. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. I know going in the same order, Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to move approval. Um, and I also would like to ask um, to you and through you to town council if we could um, either make it a requirement or have a comment um, if this is a successful vote from the board to move approval to address the issue of the call button for the attendant, um, whether you're handicapped, able-bodied or otherwise. Um, and I think that's really just sort of an automatic feature. Um, looking at other cities in town, um, sometimes you got to hit that button because your credit card isn't working. So um, the, the question to you and through you is uh, A, move approval, B, if we can either make it a requirement that there's an attendant feature, attendant call feature, or if we can put that in the remarks that that's something the board strongly recommends and is interested to hear um, from town meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. And and uh, I think as, as the depending on how our vote comes out, we'll look to Attorney Heim uh, on that as well in terms of what can be incorporated. But that that clearly is a concern that we would like to see have addressed. Um, uh, Mr. Hurd, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll second the motion. I think um, I'm satisfied that we can come to a consensus as to how to address the concern of of. Uh, providing service for patrons that need an attendant. Um, and again, like Mr. Helmuth said, this things that is articles that this board has some sway on and then there's articles that really should just go to town meeting. We don't want to go through the process of requiring a substitute motion. So I'm happy with approval to put this in front of town meeting so that we discuss further there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm happy to recommend positive action on this too. I mean, I think some voice activated technology can help with calling folks. And I guess the only concern though is who is on the other end of the call? Because to the extent that you know, uh, Mr. Heim said that you don't necessarily have to have someone staff that can do the pumping, then if they're calling and they don't get the help that they want, then the call isn't going to do them much good. And if employment is an issue well i guess i guess if an employment is an issue there the, the, there won't be anyone at the station period because we just can't have anyone working so I'm, and, and so it's easy for me to get to a uh, yes positive action on this it's harder for me to get to uh 
ironclad solution for access. I mean, but I mean, this, but we'll we'll do the best we can. You know, I mean, I think uh, everyone is coming at this with a good faith um, effort with respect to providing access. I mean, and I think as long as that's in place, I mean, we can get to uh, where we want to be. So that's it. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Diggins. It, yeah, I'm also inclined to support this. I don't have the statistics across the state, but I do know every one of the surrounding communities around us allow self-serve uh, no matter where you go. But I, I will also say this, I think there are some gas stations in town that will continue to provide full service and then that will probably help their business because they're, we see it a little bit in Belmont that, that, that there's a Pleasant Street gas station that has full services, others that have self-service. And I think um, you know, there, there are people who prefer self-service, there's people who still prefer full service depending on the station and, and, and the makeup. And this is giving the gas station owners potentially a, a choice in terms of what the, uh, the business model is. And uh, I agree this ultimately is a decision for town meeting, but uh, with safeguards that we can put in place, I'm, I'm uh, happy to support it at, uh, at, at least for a vote of the board. Uh, any further comments from the board members? Nope, seeing none. Okay, so on a motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Attorney Hine. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Higgins? Yes. Mr. Helmer? Yes. Mrs. Vaughn? Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's an unanimous vote. Okay, thank you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. All right, next thank is, you. this is article nine is next. It's an article bylaw amendment achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions from town facilities consistent with the town of Arlington's net zero action plan. Um, I'm gonna turn it to Mr. Chapdelaine and there may be a speaker from the Clean Energy Futures Committee with us as well. Correct, so I will promote Coralie Cooper who will, um, she, she's joining us. And then I think for the next article, <laughs> Pat Hanlon, will also join us, but I will take the lead on this first, this first article. Okay. Um, so this article was filed at the request of the Clean Energy Future Committee, focused on updating the existing town bylaw, which requires that uh, new building construction or significant renovation of town or school facilities be built to lead silver standards. That's what the current bylaw says, and it's the way the town's been operating for nearly 20 years and has built a number of buildings that have either met lead silver or in some cases exceeded lead silver and achieved lead gold status. With the adoption of the net zero goal by the select board and then ultimately the net zero action plan, it's been recommended that we update and strengthen that uh, section of the bylaw to contemplate requiring a higher standard or a net zero standard for significant uh, building renovations or new constructions for, again, town and school buildings. Ultimately, after filing this article, a group of us from the Clean Energy Future Committee, as well as representation from the Permanent Town Building Committee, met to discuss this a few times. And the conclusion we came to was really twofold. One, we're about to embark on a building electrification study for all school buildings, which is going to greatly inform what we can and should be doing uh, on our school buildings. And I think that could greatly inform what an eventual bylaw update would look like. And secondly, there's no projects that are going to begin or even begin design in the next year. So waiting to allow these studies to better inform a, propo a proposal will allow, we won't lose any ground or make investments that won't be in compliance with an eventual proposal if we wait a year to better put together that proposal. So ultimately, um, after talking with the leadership of the Clean Energy Future Committee, what I wanna ask the board to, to, to do tonight is vote favorable action on simply a statement asking town meeting to both endorse and request a recommendation to be brought back to the 2023 town meeting so that we can get the board to go on record supporting this initiative and then get town meeting to go on record supporting it as well um, so that we can come back ready next year. Thank you, Mr. Chapter. Uh, did Ms. Cooper want to add anything? I don't. She's I'll here. just add that uh, the Clean Energy Future Committee supports um, this approach. Thank, thank you, Ms. Cooper. And, and uh, Attorney Cunningham is also 
joined us this evening. And uh, I, I want to thank Attorney Cunningham and, and Attorney Heim for the uh, the memo to us and, and for the thorough discussion on home rule. Um, we appreciate that as, as well as the Warren article. So on the uh, recommendation of the town manager, I'll now turn to board members. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Sorry, I'm muted and then I muted. Um, <clears throat> I'm, um, I'm certainly in favor of this. I'd like to put it out there to uh, move favorable action to endorse and request a recommendation um, for a report to the 2023 town meeting on this issue. Great. Thank, on you. The Florida. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Hurt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Happy to second that motion. Thank you, uh, Mr. Diggins. Um, yeah, I mean that seems reasonable. I mean, I'm a little, I'm a little curious as to how we got to to this point, but but that can be a discussion at another time. You know, um, it is a hearing. You know, so I'm interested in hearing what um, other uh, mem other um, residents may say. But uh, they can know where I'm headed on this. Thanks. Thank Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Mr. Helen. Uh, thank you. No questions at this time. Okay. And um, I, I support this as well, but uh, as Mr. Diggins said, this is a public hearing on the Warren article. Are there any members of the public who wish to be heard? There are no hands raised right now, Mr. Chairman. Okay. All right. So on a um, motion, unless members have any other comments or I don't think so. Oh, Mr. Chaplin? I mean, if the chair would indulge me, I can try to respond to Mr. Dayan's um, sure. question about how we got here. I mean, I think ultimately I would say sometimes you hit full throttle thinking you're going to get somewhere and wanting to put, you know, you put it on the warrant because you want to be ready and it's full throttle. And then you take the time with the appropriate stakeholders to dig into it and you realize that maybe it's not fully cooked yet. Um, I think that's that's what happens here. So, so then, so... So the, what I heard you say though earlier was that we pro you probably won't come back to us with something that is less, um, oh, what's the word for it? He, that it's less aspirational than what we have here? Or no, I mean, I, I, what we really need to work out, Mr. Dingens, is what exactly we want the bylaw to apply to, okay. right? What, what type of renovation? Are we going to have it applied to when we're changing out rooftop units on schools or do we have to do a, an envelope renovation as well to trigger compliance with a bylaw like this? And then I think we also need to work out who's going to be the arbiter of the bylaw. Is it going to be the permanent town building committee? Is it going to be a new body that's not currently established? So those are the type of details we want to we want to work through. I think Mr. Schlick may have some ideas, but that's for a later time. So, so all right. Thank you. I'm all set. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, so a motion by Mrs. Mahan that was seconded by Mr. Hurd for favorable action. Um, uh, Attorney Hine. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmer? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Chairman Ms. Cooper. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cooper. And the next item is an article resolution. This is Article 73. Um, a resolution for a true net zero opt-in code for cities and towns. I believe Mr. Hanlon is going to be making the presentation on this. So. We, we have both Coralie and Pat here. So I, Coralie, are you taking the lead? I'm just going to say a few words and I'm going to hand sure. it to Pat. So thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Um, I'm, we're here to ask the board to support the warrant asking the town to vote to endorse a resolution calling upon the Department of Energy Resources to promulgate a net zero stretch code. The Clean Energy Future Committee voted on January 14th to see if um, the town will vote to endorse this resolution calling upon DOER to, to promulgate the uh, tr a true, near, true net zero stretch code. Um, and I'll provide just a little bit of background. Um, on why the CFC voted on the way they did on this. So um, one of the underpinnings of Arlington's net zero action plan is making homes and buildings super energy efficient and also um, without operate without fossil fuels. 
and to meet the goals of the NZAP plan, about more than about 400 uh, buildings per year over the next 30 years are going to need to become net zero in order to meet the net zero action plan. And uh, a really key part of meeting the NZAP goals is the establishment of a net zero stretch code that allows communities to ensure that new construction and major renovation will be built to net zero standards and helps ensure that buildings are not locked into high emissions for years into the future or um, even worse, have to be retrofit sometime in the future to be net zero. So it's extremely important that DOAR promulgate um, a municipal opt-in stretch code for new buildings. So that's the my brief background on why the CFC supports this. And I'm gonna turn it over to Pat for more detail. Good evening, Mr. Hanlon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's been about two years since I last appeared before you to discuss the general issue that was involved here in our clean heat resolution or clean heat bylaw that was approved eventually at the end of 2020. And right about the same time that that was being approved uh, by town meeting by an overwhelming majority, um, the general court was struggling with a, a veto of the uh, stretch code by the governor. Uh, over the next several months, the looks like he's frozen. Yeah, Mr. Hanley, you just the froze. General, oh, uh, if you could go back, Mr. Hanley, you just froze um, you, after the general court was struggling. Okay, the general court uh, enacted a uh, the 2021 Cl uh, Climate Act. Uh, it had in it two provisions. One had to do with updating an existing stretch code uh, that applied to various. Uh, yeah, maybe if you have the same issue, take your video off, possibly. Yeah, if, if you can hear us, Mr. Uh, Hanley. And, and there's, yeah, there's no real loss. Yeah, I'm hearing you fine. Okay. Okay. Let me keep trying. Sure. Um, I have a message that my internet connection is. The dreaded unstable connection message. Okay. Um, Ms. Cooper, I don't know if you want to anything. Maybe Mr. Hanlon can try to reestablish the connection. We can allow him to continue. Mr. Chaplin? And I, I mean, I can. Um, I, I can't say it as well as Pat, um, but Mr. Hanlon and I have been working really closely together on this issue and trying to build a coalition of municipalities to support the strongest possible net zero stretch energy code. Um, so again, I, I, I won't uh, be able to provide it in the level of depth that Mr. Hanlon would, but. So the legislature passed and the governor signed um, the roadmap legislation, which called for the promulgation of an opt-in net zero stretch energy code. Um, long time went by waiting for their draft proposal to come out. And it was issued, I think we're looking at two, two and a half weeks ago now, they issued what they're called their straw man uh, draft net zero proposal that frankly really disappointed um, most climate activists uh, or really anybody paying attention to the matter. Um, you might recall, I think I had shared with the board, I had gathered signatures from 29 other communities, a th total of 30, including Arlington, to send a letter to the Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs asking to draft and release the strongest draft possible now working with Mr. Hanlon and others, we're trying to draft a letter asking for them to improve the straw man that they um, that they did recently release, but ultimately in asking the board and town meeting to adopt this resolution, we'd be asking the whole town, you know, not just myself, um, but the whole town via the town meeting to go on record in support of the promulgation of the strongest code possible. Um, the decision about whether or not to opt into that code will be a future decision this town can make. But I think there's, um, all the logic in the world to having access to the strongest code that can be promulgated uh, in order for us to attempt to meet our climate goals. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Chaplin. Mr. Hanlon, I, I don't know if you can still 
hear us if you wanted to add anything. Okay. And um, fortunately, that may not be possible. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it to uh, board members and I'll start with Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and want to thank the Clean Energy Futures <clears throat> Committee. The last one, Adam. Sorry. Um, I want to thank the Clean Energy Futures Committee for their work on this and the town manager for his leadership and guidance. Sorry, my phone keeps dinging. Um, yeah, I mean, we we don't have to explain to anybody on this board the clear and present dangers that we have with climate change. And I would just say that it's reassuring the constant leadership that our town government and our town re residents exude in the fight against climate change, both locally at the state level and I mean, I would say at the national level that our locality for its size is really leading the charge on forward thinking measures to combat climate change now and in the future. So I would be very happy to move po positive action on this article. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, um, so I see resolutions really be probably the, the most um, beneficial thing they do is they provide a, a, a forum for educating in residents. And uh, so I just want to try to understand a little better why it is in, that the government did the veto, and, and secondly, why we got I mean, such a weak um, set of standards. Do you have a sense why it's the case? This, uh, this would be to um, the town manager, Mr. Chair. Okay. So this, is, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for you to respond to Mr. Diggins. Uh, you know, th this is projection or reaction. You know, not that I can point to it in hard fact, but. My sense has been that there is tension between, uh, in general, the construction industry and the promulgation of this code, and then more specifically, concern that the promulgation of this code and the eventual adoption by municipalities will make the cost of housing increase at a rate higher than it's already increasing. Now, there's debate um, around whether or not that's true. Um, there are studies that have demonstrated that implementation of net zero construction is not actually in a life cycle analysis more costly than um, standard construction as you'd see it today. And I think to some degree, we saw that locally here in Arlington with the um, Downing Square Broadway initiative by the Housing Corporation of Arlington, right? Those are fully electric housing units, affordable housing that were, were built um, built all electric with heating, uh, heating and cooling, uh, utilizing air source heat pumps. So that's not, I mean, that's an anecdote, right? It's not the whole story, but I think ultimately, um, when, when you see the governor's administration favoring a less aggressive posture, and even sometimes advocates favoring a less aggressive posture, it's because of concern about increasing the cost of housing. To your point about education um, and the purpose of a resolution being education, I think taking the opportunity to get town meeting to both support, but also be informed about the possibility of us bringing back a net zero code to them to adopt in a future uh, at a future town meeting session would be really the, the, the key for what we're looking at to educate uh, via this resolution this year. Okay. That was very helpful. You know, it's, it's good to know I mean, what the motivation is behind um, the opposition and if it's the cost of housing, because you just got to understand where they're coming from in order to get a better sense of how it is to get them to align with your interests, because that's generally the way uh, to success. And so that was, um, that was educational for me. So thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Manager. And I'm all set, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Did, Mr. Diggins, did you second Mr. Hurt's motion? Um, I think I did, but if I didn't, let me do it again. I second Mr. Chair on uh, Mr. Hurt's motion. I was a little behind on my notes. Thank, thank, thank yeah. you. Uh, Mr. Helmut. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm grateful to Mr. Diggins for his questions because I think uh, a few things in Mr. Tatflane's response were also very helpful. Um, and I think one, one word that really stuck out to me is lifetime cost. Uh, when it comes to thinking about the investments that we need to make with uh, towards net zero and into climate mitigation in general, I often you know, hear people say, we can pay a little bit now or we can pay a lot more later. 
And I think even, even with housing and, and, and building, there's, there's good data and good evidence that, that you, you do it right. And actually, the, even the short-term cost can be neutral. Um, but it is far from neutral if we keep uh, trying to save money in the near term, particularly if there's concerns from one sector. You know, I, I, I guess I have more confidence in the free market than sometimes our free market governor does, frankly, that the market and, and the industry will adapt if these codes are in place because consumers want this. Um, and I think that you know, we, we have to continue taking leadership that Arlington is doing uh, to, to say, we understand that the cost may be a little bit different up front, uh, but, it, but the cost of doing nothing or, or, or not doing enough in time is gonna be infinitely greater in the future and be borne by our children and, and other generations. So um, I'm very grateful for this work and, and delighted to have signed on to this uh, myself as, a, as an individual member of the board. And I love to get this front of town meeting and hope for a ringing endorsement there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mrs. Mahan. Mrs. Mahan? Oh, sorry, I can never okay. tell on my phone. Um, uh, no questions, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to support. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to support this as well. Mr. Chapterlain had referenced the letter that he had sent um, along with 20, there were 30 municipal leaders in all back in, at the end of November, November 29th, that was sent um, to the Secretary of the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. And it really showed a commitment among communities to work together and to want to participate in this process. And um, it, it, that, that's, that letter and, and some background on it's still available on our website, but I'm, I'm happy to support, support this as well. Um, this is again, a, a public hearing. I don't know if there are any members of the public that wish to be heard on, on this uh, proposed resolution. No, there okay. are no hands raised right now. Seeing none. Okay, so on a motion for favorable action by uh, made by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Diggins. Attorney Hunt. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmut. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Korsky. Yes. Chairman Ms. Vogt. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Thank you, Ms. Cooper. Thank you. Okay, next is a article for home rule legislation for early voting for town elections. Is, is Mr. Dennis with us on, on this this evening? Yes, he is. I'll okay. pull him to panelist right now. Okay, he should be joining the meeting. Good evening, Mr. Dennis. Good evening. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Uh, again, I'm Greg Dennis, Chair of the Election Modernization Committee. Uh, the Election Modernization Committee has been interested for some time in offering early voting for town elections. When we first took a look at this um, back in 2019, we saw that the city of Cambridge had the prior year tried through home, the home rule process to offer early voting um, through a home rule petition, but it was not acted upon by the state legislature. So, we didn't think it would have a good shot, so we sort of put it on the back burner while we pursued other improvements that we thought were more immediately actionable. In the time since then, well, since we first looked at early voting, the terrain seems to have shifted somewhat in our favor. In the COVID era, a lot of the measures to introduce added flexibility in voting has been well received, and there's a lot of interest uh, in the State House, um, along with the longstanding interest among reform groups, to make some of these kinds of reforms more permanent. So we do think um, early voting through home rule now does have a chance of passage, but even if it isn't approved, it, will, it would still stand as an important statement made by the town that we'd like to see early voting options be made available for municipal elections. The uh, home rule legislation that we drafted for your consideration sets a minimum number of days and hours at which early voting would be offered. The deadlines in there for establishing the site and hours are set to be the same as the existing early voting deadlines for state elections. And in our draft, the select board has given the authority to, in consultation with the clerk, make early voting available beyond those minimums. Uh, under the minimums set forth, um, early voting would largely be available 
during the regular business hours of the clerk's office. And the clerk anticipates that the volume of early voters would be manageable uh, within existing staff so as to not have at most a, a negligible impact on the clerk's budget. Um, that's it, thank you. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Dennis. Uh, turn to the board, uh, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And as a member of the, as a liaison me from the select board to the election and modernization committee, I am happy to uh, recommend positive action on this. I mean, I think um, it's a good, very good home petition. What I like about it um, in particular is that it makes it possible for people who, um, is, let's say an election is on a weekday, you know, one of the days that we make available is a weekend day. And likewise, if a election is on a weekend day, um, a week day is made available for people who may not be free I mean, on a weekday or a weekend day. Uh, and I'd also um, like to express my appreciation to um, Mr. Dennis and all the other folks on the EMC uh, for the great work they've been doing. Um, uh, and I joined them partway through around replacing uh, Mr. Kuro. Uh, and it's, it's, um, it's a really good committee, you know, really good people doing lots of good work. It's, it's probably the last time um, Mr. Dennis will be in front of us as part of the committee because the committee's life is um, coming to an end. Me, but uh, I have expressed the, that the um, civic engagement group of Envision Arlington would be happy to have me um, those capable residents working with us being on similar issues I mean, for as long as the desire is there. So that's it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm delighted to second this as well and also second all the sentiments that Mr. Diggins so eloquently expressed. Thank you for your work, uh, Greg and, and all your colleagues. Thank, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mrs. Mahan. Um, no questions. Uh, once again, happy to support this. Great to see Mr. Dennis. I apologize. I had to run out and get another charger <laughs> because I'm having every uh, technological problem you can have tonight. I'm definitely having. So, um, and as far as whether uh, you, this committee continues on or there's another iteration through revision or anything else, um, I'll be happy to watch you and give you future accolades. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Dennis, and to all the Election Modernization Committee for all the work over the past few years. Um, we're at a time which is almost unthinkable that there's people around some parts of the country that are trying to restrict voting access. And it's, again, good to see that Arlington is leading the charge to increase voter access. And in the elections that we have been allowed to have early voting I've actually I've used that option and walked down the town hall and I like to be able to do that at my leisure as opposed to having to do it on the specific election day so I think this is a great a step in the right direction and I'm happy to support it thank you Mr. Hurd um yeah I'm, not, I'm also happy to support this and I do want to take the opportunity as well to thank Mr. Dennis for all the work that he has done on the election modernization committee on top of appearing before us you know he has talked to a number of us whenever i've had questions um has answered them we haven't always agreed on everything but we've had good healthy discussions and he's always well prepared and, and really brought a lot to this committee so thank you for that mr dennis um i also want to point out, my understanding is the on on the legislation that that is in in the uh, legislature that the Senate would allow early voting for municipalities as of right. The House would allow a local option. They're, they're having issues on, on other matters, namely same day voter registration. But if, if this does proceed, this does not seem to be something that's um, gonna be held up in the legislature, is that right? Uh, on, on the state legislation, not on the home rule. Right, so the, the legislation pending is the Votes Act and it is under consideration. And we thought about what implications it would have for this. And um, right now, like the, the Votes Act isn't a done deal and the provision for municipal, allowing early voting municipal elections is not a done deal. So we thought this was important in that even if the Votes Act passes with an option, 
it would still be nice to have this codified that we are offering this. And under the Votes Act, the Select Board would have to reauthorize, um, at least in the Senate version, I think, would have to reauthorize early voting every year um, in order to have it, whereas this makes it a more permanent fixture. Um, you know, if the Votes Act passes and we set this before the Election Laws Committee, there is a chance the Election Laws Committee says, uh, we already gave you the Votes Act, so we're not giving you this. And well, right. absolutely. But if we get both, we think they can work together. And, you know. Sure. Yeah, no, and I'm, I'm happy to support this as well. I think it makes good sense. Uh, Mr. Hurd, did you want to add something? No, I was just going to add that I think Mr. Dennis is probably very relieved after the rank, all the rank choice voting presentations last year to have a presentation to us that's easy to explain. It doesn't require multiple uh, visual aids. So, okay, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Yeah, no candy to make us hungry either in the in the example. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, and anyway, uh, uh, so on a, a motion by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Helmuth for favorable action. Attorney Hine. Mr. Hurd. Um, Mr. Chair, did we ask for public comment? Oh, you're right. This is a public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. I, I, I got ahead of myself. Uh, is there anybody who wishes to be heard on this, Mr. Chaplain? There are no hands raised, Mr. Chairman. Okay, all right. Um, so on, on the motion by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Helmuth, Attorney Hine. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Corsi. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Dennis. And again, thank you for all the work that you've done uh, with the Election Modernization Committee. All right. Uh, next, we have, um, I believe we, we have Mr. Schlickman on the next four. Uh, Warren articles. Um, the next one is a article bylaw amendment uh, noise abatement, and that is Article 15. Mr. Schlickman should be joining shortly. Good evening, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, good evening, my friends. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, Article 15, uh, Bylaw Amendment Noise Abatement, is looking to both clarify and strengthen the current noise abatement bylaw. I don't know if you have had the experience of waking up to a sewer jetting truck outside your bedroom at 4 o'clock in the morning. I have. There are three instances that are documented in the support documentation that I presented to you since... 2011, in which the Public Works Department has decided uh, on a non-emergency basis to either get jackhammers or sewer jetting trucks outside my bedroom window at a very early hour. Uh, it was easier for them, so they said, to do um, overtime, to come in early to do this work while there isn't a lot of traffic on Pleasant Street, or on Mystic Street. Um, the last time this happened, I wrote to the town and the ta deputy town manager said, well, you know, this bylaw really doesn't apply to us because it's in Title V regulations uh, upon the use of private property. And we're the town and this is a town street, so there's no private property. It doesn't really apply to us. Uh, but if you read the bylaw, it certainly intended to apply to both private property owners and the municipality. I'm seeking to do th two things. One is to take the whole bylaw and move it out of the um, regulations upon the use of private property and plop it into Title VIII Public Health and Safety so that there's no longer an excuse of saying, well, you know, it's private property, it doesn't apply to us. Secondly, I'd like to find a way with council and and the select board to propose tightening this bylaw so that the routine things that you need to do in the middle of the night such as line painting and street sweeping which really isn't usually a bother can go on but major things that are non-emergency such as jackhammers and sewer jetting doesn't occur in the prohibited hours 
So that's the purpose of bringing before you Article 15 to do two things. One, to put it where it belongs in the bylaws, and two, to make sure that uh, it's clear in the bylaws that jackhammers and sewer jetting trucks and other very, very, very loud things aren't operating at 4 a.m. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Schuchman. Uh, I'll now turn to the board. Uh, Mr. Helmut. Thank you. Um, I had a couple of questions. And uh, Mr. Chair, I think I might need your help in deciding where to direct these, whether they be to town council or to the town manager or to the proponent. Um, under the proposed change, uh, would the town manager still have discretion to authorize uh, all the noxious activities that, that the proponent is, is mentioning? Um, and if so, would there be any limits to that discretion? Um, you know, out, outside of the general prohibition. To, so would the town manager have the, the authority uh, under this proposal to, um, to make exceptions? Okay. And, and was that a question? I'm sorry, Mr. Helmut. I don't know if um, you want the Attorney Hines' view on that. You want Mr. Schlickman's view on that, or um, you know, I think Attorney Hines would be probably, probably be a good place to start. Yeah, thank you, Attorney Hines. I don't. I'm not sure what Mr. Schlickman is, is contemplating. So I think I think we should ask him whether or not he, he he's seeking something that would uh, sort of confine the town manager's discretion or not. I don't necessarily think that's what he what he indicated, but it okay. it is it is something that has come up from time to time with respect to these activities. Just to be clear on one piece, though, um, while sure. I have a moment is yeah. that I, I think what we would if the board is inclined to support Mr. Slickman's um, proposal, I think what Mr. Slickman is saying is only to move. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I, I think just to be clear, Mr. Slickman is proposing to move this whole thing to regulate uh, public health regulations. Essentially, um, I think the entirety of the bylaw is going to go with it. Is that correct, Mr. Slickman? Yes, it would. Okay. Uh, thank you. And, and I, so I guess I'll ask Mr. Slickman, um, since we don't have specific, um, I mean, we have your, your memo in front of us, is your intention that there would still be a provision for the town manager to authorize uh, the jackhammering and the sewer pumping if the town manager you know, believes that there's um, an emergency situation or other public safety situation, you know, that, that would necessitate that during the prohibited hours? Uh, no, well, the thing is, is that there's already an exemption in the bylaw pertaining to emergencies. So that if there's a flood and you need to jet the sewer to, uh, to stop the water from flooding, you do that. If there is a, uh, it, anything that's causing an immediate concern that's an emergency, uh, the bylaw doesn't address that. What, what we're looking at are things that are scheduled. Oh, well, we do want to go and jet this, um, the, the, the sewer drain. So why don't we schedule it at 4 a.m.? Uh, so we'll bring in the crew at 4 a.m. We'll schedule some overtime. Schedule is the key word. And if you notice from the pictures of the two incidences of the uh, sewer jetting, these were very dry occasions where they just decided to bring in the crew at 4 a.m. to do this. Uh, now, I do not want to force upon the town manager or the town a solution to uh, building a fence around this situation, be it uh, by notifying the select board and abutters or to uh, to declare some public purpose beyond just somebody uh, making a declaration. I don't think Adam Chapdeline just sat there and decided, hey, let's send the sewer jetting truck outside of Schlickman's bedroom window at 4 a.m. and wake him up. I don't think this happened. Uh, there, there's something that's not working here. And that after three instances of jackhammers and sewer jetting, um, We've got we we've got to put a tighter control on this. So this is only ha something this drastic and this loud and this disturbing is only happening in a time of emergency. It's not something that's routinely scheduled, and to have this happen three times over the course of ten years means that this is just sort of the way we do business, and that's got to stop. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the clarification. Uh, Mr. Chair, through you, I wonder if the town manager could, could comment on 
any of the specific situations, and particularly, I think the concern that this is a uh, a, a a standard practice. Um, I'd be interested to know if overtime was a consideration in any of these things, or if there are other considerations, just so we can have a fuller picture of of the town administration's perspective on this as we contemplate, you know, whether we want to whether we want to ask town meeting to further restrict uh, the executive brand, you know, the executive's um, ability to do this. Mr. Chaplin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I spoke with the public works director uh, before tonight's meeting, just to refresh my recollection and, and to talk with him so we could both um, refresh our recollection of how these particular work uh, instances of work occurred. And we, you know, without frankly diving into email correspondence, we, we both agreed that there was an instance where there was scheduled work and they asked for my authorization to do that work at this particular site because of concerns about uh, traffic, uh, traffic safety impacts of doing it during, uh, during the day. Um, we know that's a very tricky intersection with uh, both motorists and pedestrians crossing. Um, so basically to maximize safety, ask for that allowance. And my recollection is that I granted it based on that request. The next time, um, I believe the next time, the crew, the water crew was in doing work at another site. And before letting that crew go home, the water sewer supervisor knew that the work needed to be done at this particular sewer because there was, a, I believe there was a big rain forecast and wanted to make sure it could be addressed. So permission was not asked. Um, they should have asked, there's no, um, that they, they, you know, they shouldn't have done it without asking, but since crews were already working, decided to address something that they knew was an issue. Uh, also knowing that permission had been granted in the past. Um, so I, that, I mean, that I can't directly address any allegations about forced overtime. Um, I don't think there's any way to substantiate such claims. Um, it's uh, work was identified to be performed to try to keep that sewer from not backing up um, and, and functioning properly. And it, it seems from the series of events that, you know, this was work that was identified that needed to be done. And, and so then it was scheduled to be done. Thank you. Um, and, and I, uh, you know, and I, and I appreciate the proponent's concerns. You know, I think it's really good to be aware of the impact that all this work does, because uh, it's not a small deal to be woken up at night. You know, I think that that needs to be considered very, very carefully. Um, and I think, you know, balancing that, we need to understand what circumstances may require that anyway. I mean, clear emergencies, I think everyone here agrees, clear, clear emergencies, like the water's, you know, there's a water main break or the water's gonna, sewers are backing up or whatever. Um, uh, if the, to the chair, if the town manager could describe your understanding of your policy and the, and the DPW's policy about uh, you know, I, I think the proponents' concerns about is this, you know, is this kind of a regular thing? Is this sort of our policy to just kind of, you know, um, regularly go outside the the hours so that, that you know that understood that with this bylaw split, this bifurcation that you know may or may not really apply. But but in general, in terms of the spirit of it, you know, what what is the what is the more standard practice here to to think about when you do work that's going to be noisy? Um, you know, with respect to daylight hours versus nighttime hours? So I would, I would say the general standard is we try to avoid it um, if at all possible. And for the most part, I mean, I could be wrong with a certain exception here or there, but for the most part, we only look at doing night work when it is on a very main roadway usually Mass Ave, maybe Broadway, maybe this area of Mystic that we're talking about here tonight. Mm -hmm. um, and I think about times in the past where we have allowed night work to pave Mass Ave. Um, I believe that was part of the East Arlington Mass Ave redesign where we did paving work mm -hmm. overnight. Um, when we repaved certain sections in the Heights, we did it overnight. We've done line painting on Mass Ave overnight. More recently, we've allowed earlier morning weed whacking on the center islands on Mass Ave. Um, and the commonality between all of those allowances are um, trying to both mitigate traffic impacts and also worker safety. 
um, when there's a larger throughput during the day, doing that work can be can be quite dangerous. Um, but it, you know, just to add a sense of the care we show um, when contemplating doing the weed whacking on the Center Islands in Mass Ave, the DPW director went and purchased all electric weed whacking equipment to try to reduce the noise. So we're not perfect, and I'm not at all disputing that sometimes this work can be disruptive to those living in proximity or trying to sleep in proximity to the work. But we do try to limit the work, and we try to exercise discretion to balance um, traffic and safety impacts with the potential disruption of the work. Yeah. Uh, and one final question. I know I'm taking a lot of time, but I hope hope these are germane to the rest of the discussion. Uh, I think this one's for the town council, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Schlickman pointed out that there is already an exception in place for emergency work. If we were to, if we, if town meeting were to make this change and consolidate it and do this move in the bylaws, would that emergency exception still apply to the best of your understanding? Or is there any concern about that? No, I, I thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Go, go right ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hellman. Um, so, you know, we'd have to draw up a vote here. Uh, I think what Mr. Schlickman has indicated is that he, he'd uh, want to work with my office to figure out exactly how all of this would fit together. Right now, there's not only a provision for an emergency, but there are some specific definitions of what an emergency means. Um, I think there's a lot of different possibilities under this warrant article, ranging from just adjusting what the uh, uh, hours of non-emergency work can be to doing that, limiting or further defining the town manager's discretion to provide for exceptions. Um, there's kind of a, a broad range of things that could come out of this. Um, so I don't think that the emergency, I don't understand Mr. Schlickman's proposal to be to uh, affect or limit the emergency uh, piece of it anyway. I think what he's suggesting would, I believe, uh, have some impact on, you know, when uh, the town, under what circumstances the town can operate outside the hours set forth in the bylaw. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it sounds, it's, um, you know, I'm interested to see what the public comments and what my colleagues say, but I think, you know, for me, the, 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 the complexity here is that it's difficult to kind of know um, what we're supporting, you know, and, and that's fine. I mean, you don't have to come to, to, to the select board with the fully written out bylaw. I think that's fine to have this conversation, but for, you know, there could be a lot of ways this is done, you know, and I think that the, the, the variability in those ways is really you know, interesting to me and probably pivotal to whether I would ultimately support it in a final vote and comment. Um, but, um, and I'm happy to move on um, to other members. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't have any questions. I can certainly sympathize with Mr. Slickman, um, given my family circumstances, being woken up outside the norm uh, is a hardship. And I live near the Audison and a major transformer, so I won't go into how many times I've been woken up. So right now, I'm just not inclined to support this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I think like Mr. Helmuth, it comes down to the language. And I think it could be something that I would support, but the main, I think where the rubber hits the road on this one is traffic concerns and whether or not, it seems from Mr. Schlickman's presentation that he doesn't he doesn't want that to be an exception that the town manager can undertake. And we're looking at this in the lens of a specific intersection, which could be could create a traffic and safety. It's not just inconveniencing motorists, but safety of work workers and motorists and pedestrians. And there's a lot of elderly in that area. Um, but we could also drop this work right in the middle of Mass Ave in front of town hall and think of the difficulty in doing this work during the during business hours in that situation so i don't think i would be inclined to support a change that would take the discretion on the town manager to authorize the work in outside of the normal business hours 
do to for legitimate safety concerns relative to traffic and whether or not the work can be done safely, I would submit that that is an exigent or emergency circumstance. We might need to kind of work with the language, whether it's emergency or exigent or however the work, the language wants to be implemented that says that if in the town manager's discretion, in addition to emergency matters, that there's legitimate safety concerns that require the work to be done outside of the prescribed hours, then I think I could get on board with that. But again, that, that's my main concern is that we implement a bylaw change and then the town manager finds out that he doesn't have the authority to, you know, to implement the work and has to go forward with work with safety issue with safety concerns about when the work can be done. So. Those are my comments, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And so just to get a sense of the, um, the scale of the problem, did I hear you right, Mr. Strickland, that this happened three times over the course of 10 years? Uh, yes, it did. And in the case of uh, the uh, manhole cover replacement, where they dug out the manhole and replaced it, the work started before 5 a.m., but the work continued beyond 10 a.m., uh, so that there was no benefit to traffic in terms of getting it done before rush hour. The work continued through rush hour. And if you're familiar with the neighborhood, uh, traffic reduces very dramatically after 9 o'clock, so that things that could be done at 5 a.m. can be done at 10 a.m. in this location. Um, and if you're starting too early and it gets into the rush hour, it, it, it provides much more of a, a, of a problem. So in terms of getting some kind of a mechanism to where this is necessary for the safety of the town, for where it's necessary to happen, to, to build another fence around it, because obviously what happened in one case is the DPW didn't even bother to notify the town manager, so it happened without authorization. Perhaps, you know, I, I left this vague because I wanted to listen to the select board because I value your input and it's much easier to get something before town meeting when I have the support of the select board than to go in uh, with a substitute motion. I want that. I want, I want your input. But what I'm really looking for is maybe notify the abutters that this is going to happen or notify the select board or notify through the town website uh, that this is going to happen so that when, when you're scheduling non-essential routine work outside the normal hours or something is really loud like a sewer jetting truck or or a um or or, or uh, jackhammers that there's another step that has to happen so that it just isn't this sort of routine thing. I understand. You know, I guess I guess we, it, I hear you, but but then when I hear like you know three times in ten years, I'm just not equating that with routine. That said, me I know what it's like to be awakened, you know, in the middle of the night, and to me, it isn't so much that I'm awakened, but what's waking me up. So, so a thunderstorm waking me up, it's like, yes, I'm awake. I don't want to be awake, but it's a thunderstorm, you know, uh, but a, a loud barking dog drives me crazy, you know, uh, and, and so I hear where you're coming from, and, and, and so uh, it, it's, but the scale of the problem isn't large by any stretch. It means like 99.9% .9 of the time, I mean, nothing's happening, at least at that location. Do you have a sense of whether this is happening in other locations? I don't know, but we are a 47 unit building. So we've got 70 or so bedrooms. Uh, so it, it's not a minor impact, at least for the people in our building. Oh. Yeah. And, and and the thing is, is that I got to tell you that this sewer jet was so jarring. The first thing I thought, I mean, I woke up, I was almost falling out of bed and I thought that somehow my Roomba decided it was going to go and have a nervous breakdown under the bed. It was it, it was right there. It was really very disturbing. 
Uh, and and I heard you laugh. Kinda, That's just and, funny. And, and, and kind of scary. It was scary till I figured out what was going on. Uh, and then, of course, I couldn't get back to sleep. But it, it, we should be able to do routine stuff in a way that isn't going and, and, and rattling people's beds. Yeah, no, I, I understand. You know, I mean, so we, we don't, um, so we can increase the hours. We're not running into the town manager act. I mean, right now there's some confinement as to when we can do non-emergency work. So it's established that the bylaw can restrict the work. Now we just, or when it happens, now it's just a matter of, of, of um, how much more we restrict it, you know? Hmm. Essentially, it's a two-step process. One, moving it, moving yeah. the bylaw into, uh, out of the uh, private property section, yeah, which yeah, I yeah. think uh, y'all should agree to because yeah. it, it brings clarity to the bylaw. It, it, it's where it belongs. The second is to find some way that the manager can live with, the DPW can live with, that 47 unit owners in 47 Mystic Street can live with, and other people who live next to busy streets can live with as well. So that it's not a routine thing. And when the town does it, they give notice, and it's something that's really, really important. It's just... So, how would you recommend that we give it teas? This is to you, Mr. Through, through the chair. Okay. I mean, there, there are a lot of different ways you can do this. Um, one is to re require further notification so that the process for doing this requires, say, notification to the select board and publication of an impending action. Uh, by making it more difficult, it puts it in a category of things that require a little more foresight and action, and do we really want to do this is the question. And so that if we were to get a notification, first of all, it wouldn't be a surprise to be woken up at 4.30 in the morning if this is happening, if we've received notification. And secondly, you could call up your favorite select person, and I love all of you and and uh, and the town manager whoever's uh doing this and and say wait a minute hold on do you really want need to do this and and, and have a say in how our town government is responding to this that would be one way to put a decibel limit on non-emergency actions is another way to go about it but i didn't want to go in presume that I have the one answer or the answer that you would feel comfortable with, the manager would feel comfortable with, and would feel comfortable with setting forth for any future managers. Um, um, through you, Mr. Chair, to the town manager. Um, so, so from the, the couple of episodes or the three to two or three that, that you recounted, I mean, I mean, one, they didn't give you any notice. I mean, the other one, I mean, did you have sufficient notice that you could have sent notice to the residents that something was going to happen? Mr. Chairman, may I? Yes, go ahead, Mr. Chairman. So, I mean, I, let me answer that maybe slightly different than you asked it, Mr. Diggins. I would say if the board in an attempt to be re responsive to Mr. Schlickman's um, requests, thinks we should build a notice provision into the exemptions or in, you know into the way this bylaw works. I think that's reasonable and we could make the time work because if it's non-emergency work that's being scheduled for an overnight hour to avoid either traffic or safety implications, um, that it can be scheduled and notice can be provided. Um, so that, um, that would be a fine, um, a fine thing to require of us. I do think I, you didn't ask me specifically this, but while I have the opportunity, I, you know, I do think that building in some type of vote of the select board to approve this type of work um, 
would have significant operational impacts and, and probably frankly be agenda items that you're not interested in having. Okay, so I, I, I was clear right up until that last part and through you, Mr. Chair. I mean, so, so for the notification part, we wouldn't have, you wouldn't have to come to the select board for that notification. No, I know, but Mr. Schlegman, I talked about sort of a menu of notification, but also possibly having select board notification or approval. Um, oh, I got you. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 No, I understand. Okay. Gotcha. Um, okay. And um, I think, and, and, and through you, Mr. Chair, to, to the, 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 Manager, so this is something. This notification could be done without. Just to be clear, without this article, we can build that in now. The notification system that you just you just mentioned. I mean, I, I think there's a way for us to build in operational policy where we would provide, you know, or, or internal policy where we would provide notification, or it could be codified in the bylaw, and, and that would be, you know, depending on what the boys' comfort level was. Okay. All right, I'm going to stop asking questions and give the, um, the chair a chance to ask some questions. He usually asks good questions, you know, get a better sense of where I'm going to go on this. This is one case where I'm not sure where I'm going. Thank you. Um, okay. thank, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, so I have a couple, uh, just want to make sure that it's all done, everybody. Um, so I, I look at this as an issue. You know, sometimes you look at something and you say, is this the problem with the standard or the application of the standard? And I, I look specifically within the bylaw as it exists now to the authorized exemptions for public and private way projects, which you had talked about, Mr. Schlickman, uh, which was added in, in, in 2018. And what this appears to come down to, to me is that there was a few decisions made over the years. And, and unfortunately, one of them was a particularly that the results was that the, the work was very loud. It was very early in the morning. One instance, the town manager approved it. One instance, he didn't. I, to me, the there is a provision there for permission of the town manager. I think, um, you know, perhaps in in one instance, the DPW should have gone to the manager to to get his permission. They didn't. So, so the application of the standard allowing permission arguably wasn't wasn't um, wasn't followed. Um, I think we we see that. Um, since then, though, the fact that we've only seen a few instances over the years, it, it, it hasn't necessarily um, been an issue. I, I understand your concern. I understand your frustration when, when you see a project that you don't believe is, is necessary early in the morning. But I, I think the language as it exists now with the town manager having the authority to approve non-emergency work um, that, that should be a mechanism that, that, that allows the town on a case-by-case -case basis to address particular needs. Now, in a couple of instances, it wasn't, but I, I'm a, a little bit um, concerned about putting more into a bylaw and taking away that discretion from the manager. But I also understand if on certain types of non-emergency work, would it be nice to, to notify uh, neighbors and abutters? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would hope if over the next few months while Mr. Chapdelaine is still here, if that, if that issue came up, he would say, yeah, we should notify the neighbors and, and, and apply this. So I, I feel um, I can live with the way the bylaw is with, with this exemption and, and just ask that the management team uh, apply it and be mindful of what the, what, what the work is. But I do have a question for you and I didn't go back, I did some research on this, but in the special town meeting back in 2018, when this subpart was adopted for the authorized exemptions, were you the proponent of it? Yes. Okay, all right. So, and at that point, you know, maybe you feel like this hasn't, uh, in the few years since, because something happened after 2018, the, the work, well, in May of 2019 and July of 2021, you feel like it didn't, the, the issue you were trying to address wasn't addressed uh, after after the fact. That, yeah, that, it, 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 if I may, uh, if the board is not interested in tightening the restrictions on what is emergency work, I would strongly urge the board to discuss and, and approve a notification provision. And, and let me tell you why. Very simple. These occurrences happen on beautiful summer nights where you open the windows and enjoy the fresh air and you're sleeping 
in, in a nice environment. With notification, you, you'd at least have warning so you'd close the windows and turn on the air conditioning uh, to, to mute, the, mute the problem when it existed. No notification whatsoever results in a very, very jarring experience. So that if you're planning this in advance and planning this and bringing in people on overtime, which is a planned event, at the very least, the town should put out some sort of a notification that this is going to happen. Okay, all right, and, and, and I agree there should be notification. The only question in my mind is whether that gets put in the bylaw or whether it's done on a case by case basis to the manager's policies and, and what will happen going forward. I, I mean, I, I would be open to considering an amendment to that subpart A. I don't, I'm not really in favor of moving this. I, I'm not really in favor of, of doing a lot with this. And, and I, I, I will say, I mean, this, the, the noise abatement bylaw has been amended between its initial enactment and afterwards but about five or six times. And, and um, I suppose we're getting there, but I, 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 I guess I would be open to considering some sort of notice provision there, but I also am concerned about um, where we don't know what type of non-emergency will come up or what, and, and maybe if you can't give notice, it becomes an emergency and you have to do the work anyway. I don't, I, I don't know, but I, I think I'd be willing to consider proposed language on that subpart 3A, but I, I don't think we should be moving this and I wouldn't really want to do too much else to this bylaw. So if, if members are interested or you know, between now and the next meeting, if there's any language that you'd want to propose, I, you know, I suppose we could consider that, but that's, that's my feeling on it just as one member. Um, I do want to open it up to the public at this point, if there are any public comments. There are no hands raised, Mr. Chairman. Okay, all right. So I will um, return to the to the board. We don't have a motion that's on the table right now, but I, I will go in the same order that I, I went previously, starting with Mr. Helmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Schlickman. Um, you know, I think um, it concerns one one apartment building, especially a large one, are are important. Um, I think that we would have more information to work with if we had a sense for how much uh, of a problem or other problems have been throughout town, because that'll give us a, a sense of the scale and the scope of it. You know, that said, I think it's a, it's, it's re, it's a reasonable um, leap to make that, that, you know, similar circumstances and similar dense populated areas, you know, could have similar impacts. But, but that is one thing that gives me a little bit of pause and being too, too far reaching. Um, I, I would be happy to um, make a limited motion um, for favorable action, but along the lines of, of a notification requirement in the bylaw. Um, you know, I think that um, it's reasonable. The, the wording would need to, would also need to be reasonable to allow um, the town manager to authorize work that for, for public safety reasons really needed to be done. Um, but I think that we could codify you know, an intention there that would uh, be helpful to residents and maybe also may also encourage the town administration to be thoughtful about when when these, these exceptions are made. Um, but I, I think that I we have to be our job is to, to be make, make sure that the town can do work that needs to be done. Um, you know, we shouldn't inconvenience residents lightly. I think we need to listen carefully when when inconveniences happen, but sometimes we need to do work that um, has impacts that that and if the timing of it is uh, has public safety or worker safety uh, implications, I think that's that's important too. So I would not, I wouldn't want to res restrict that because it's difficult to know uh, what the circumstances are. Every situation is a little bit different. So I, I would be um, my motion. I think would be for notification, and you know, be interested to see what my colleagues would want to do with that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Stanley. Just and just for clarification and a favorable action, what the, Mr. Schlickman is asking for here is to to move this entire bylaw from one title to another. And, and we had talked about the notification procedures, which is within one section. It's in oh, section yeah. three a three or three a three a, if you will, of the um, of the current bylaw. So I. I do you want to move favorable action to move this and to work on notification or just to work on potential notification language and keep the bylaw where it is? 
Um, I think I've learned to trust people who know a lot more about this than I do. And Mr. Chair, I would include you in that group. So I would follow your lead, I think, in not moving it. Um, open to further discussion. Maybe this will get us to a town meeting. So I would like to limit my favorable action motion um, to adding a notification provision in the bylaw in the appropriate place or places. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Um, Mrs. Mahan? Hey, um, I'm not sure how Mr. Helmuth will take this. <laughs> it, um, what's before us is what Mr. Slickman is proposing. Um, so my, my motion would be to move no action, but that in our comments, we say that um, we have uh, instructed the town manager and town council um, to come up with language for a notification um, policy or procedure. But what's before us is whether, in my interpretation, we um, support um, Mr. Schluckman's recommendation to uh, take out the whole citation that he's um, brought to our attention and, and, and put it somewhere else. I'm, so I'm not in favor of that. I am in favor of the notification, but on what's before us, I, I, I would move no action. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mahan. So Mr. Hurd, it's gonna to come to you with two motions, neither of which have been seconded yet. So- uh, um, Well, I have a few questions. Sure. <laughs> so I, I guess in, I'll have to forgive my ignorance of Tommy procedures, but, I guess for Attorney Heim, so can we vote on this? Our, so I guess I'll take Mr. Helmuth's motion. Can we vote on positive action while leaving the bylaw is current section and just recommending that we, we come up with a proposed bylaw change that implements a notice requirement? Mr. Hurd, I, I think the, the best way to articulate your question is, is would it be in scope to do one but not the other? Yeah. Um, and, and while that's ultimately a decision for the moderator, I do think that you have more than one way to skin a cat. Um, you could do as Mrs. Mahan is suggesting, <clears throat> which is vote no action and put in your comment that you'd like to have a certain policy developed. Um, I think that you could, um, quote, further regulate non-emergency work by DPW um, because it has that or take any action related there too, I believe. It would ultimately be up to the moderator to determine whether it's in scope, but um, but um, that's, I think, I, th I think that it could probably be done, probably. In my second question that from the discussions we've had on this is, is it my understanding that if we do not move this bylaw into the new section as Mr. Schlickman's recommending, does the bylaw not apply to the town? Is it this question for me, Mr. Yes. Yeah, so this has been a long standing area of uh, sort of ambiguity. And, and as Mr. DeCourcy referenced in 2018, we tried to resolve this uh, question about it because it's the bylaw does clearly contemplate uh, and always did before even before the 2018 revision it does clearly contemplate some kind of public works activity but it's very oddly placed in quote regulations upon the use of private property um, because as you know uh, it is 100 percent true that public ways are not private property so it's a very strange to find a section that's devoted to a very clear subject with a subpart that is totally out of sync. So the, one of the things that happened in 2018 is we tried to uh, clarify it a little bit by providing this <clears throat> specific process for um, work in the public, public ways. But um, I, there's not a great answer to this other than it's pretty odd that it's a private property regulation title and a specific provision regulating the town government um, in that specific um, instance. So I, I we have been applying this section, 
um, after that initial discussion took place. Um, but we tried to clarify it without moving the whole thing in 2018. Thank you, Chang. And I guess my last question would likely be to the town manager, but I'm not sure anybody can answer this. So is it feasible or practical to have a notice requirement that says, and I don't know what the number is, that if there's a reasonable expectation that the work being done will create more than X decibels of sound. Whereas, and I know understanding that probably nobody in the DPW or even town government is able to specifically pinpoint that, but to create some sort of standard that, I mean, if they're painting the, the streets, that can be done overnight at the discretion of, of the town manager. If they're doing some sort of majorly disruptive work that that requires notice to the abutters. Ms. Chaplin? Yeah, yeah. So I, I wasn't sure if you were if you if yeah, you were through asking the question. So yeah, yeah, I mean I think um and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um I, I think your instinct is right that it would be hard to set a decibel limit because the Board of Health does have decibel meters, but um you know, hard to, hard to really do that quick science on how far the sound travels and at what yeah. decibel level is that. I mean, I guess I would rather say if the board um, is, you know, interested in codifying in some form a notice that we just say we're going to do it when we're doing overnight work of any fashion, right? Even line painting work, there's a compressor involved. It's not a jackhammer, but there's a compressor that could wake somebody um, even street sweeping provides, you know, it, it, it's very momentary, but it sounds like a hurricane blows by your house when, you know, when the street sweeper goes by. So um, I think it's probably easier to manage it if, if it's just an across the board requirement that we provide notification. Yeah. And Mr. Chaplin, do you think, in your opinion, is it an overly burdensome administrative uh, problem to create, to send notices in these instances? I, I don't think so. Yeah, I have to be honest. In, in many instances where we have done overnight work, like the paving work on Mass Ave that I mentioned earlier, we have provided notices. Um, I think it could be that we didn't provide notice for this because we expected it to be a short duration and perhaps weren't as aware of the disruption that it would cause. But I think between flyering and utilizing the Arlington Alert system that you can provide very targeted phone calls to residents, it should not be overly administratively burdensome to provide notice. All right, so I guess I'll do this. I will second Mr. Helmuth's motion. I will second Mrs. Mahan's motion and say that, I mean, however we move forward, I think it's reasonable to take the current provision and say that in the instances that we're gonna, going to be doing work outside of business hours, since we do it sometimes and we don't do it in others, it just makes, plain good old sense to notify abutters in any situation that the town manager exercises discretion to allow work outside of the regularly scheduled business hours. And again, I'll look to my colleagues to figure out the best vehicle to achieve that. Hey, th th thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's funny. I thought the easy part was gonna be moving it from from section five to section eight, you know, so, so I'm surprised that we're not headed in that direction. I mean, I uh, did agree with Mrs. Mahan that we did have to decide on what was in front of us, I mean, and I thought that we trying to do a notification policy, you know, um, or probably to institute notification was kind of outside of the bounds kind of the, of the proposed article. Um, and so I was, feeling that, yeah, we will no action on the article, uh, but then we say that we would recommend the, the policy action that we are, I think, converging on, and that is that there be notification of overnight work. I'm totally on board with that. But like I said, I am surprised that we're not going to move it from five to eight, because the I thought the town council made a good case for that. So, so I'm not going to model this by um, making another motion. I'm just a little 
perplexed as to where to go here, you know. Uh, but you got it second on everything, and um, I'm not sure where I'm going to land, you know. So, um, uh, but I'll vote. On, I'll vote one way or another a little bit. I'm sure. Okay, so I'm done now. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Diggins. And and I I think we've narrowed in on on what the issue we we want notice to be provided. The question is, is it through a policy of the town manager? Or can we put something in this um, section A three A that that adds notice that 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 we're comfortable with? So I mean, it's really going to come down to when Attorney Heim comes back to us with the um, proposed final vote how how we like this language uh, regarding notice. So um, before I say anything further, I see Mr. Hurd's hand up. I mean, Mr. Chair, since there's some confusion as to the proper view, I think. Attorney Heim and everyone seems to have similar ideas as to how we tackle this problem. Do we have time in our scheduled meetings to essentially continue this to a, a next meeting, have Attorney Heim come back and say, this is the best way to handle this, or you propose to the, the board one or two ways that we can handle this and we take a vote at that time and then have final votes and comments at the following meeting i, I i'm comfortable with that if you want to make a motion to do that i mean I, I i think um that makes sense because it's really a matter i i could support either motion at this point depending on what the what the language is and if attorney heim came back to us said this is what it would look like if we added language to the to the bylaw and, yeah. and working with the town manager, this is what a policy would look like. And then we decide. Yeah, because maybe it's just me. I'm just not uh, like, I think we're all again on board as to what we're trying to achieve here. I'm just not clear yet as to which motion I'd be supporting. Right. So I guess I will make a third competing motion to continue a vote on this to our next scheduled meeting with the idea that attorney Heim will come back and give us some clarification as with based on the board comments. Okay, and do we have a second for that motion? I'll, I'll second it. Okay, thank you. And then I, I just, I, I do want to ask you, Mr. Chair, though, because you, you said that you weren't in favor of moving in the, the bylaw from section five to eight. I'm not clear on why you don't, because like I said, I thought that was just going to be the easy part, you know, because I thought Attorney Hunt made a good case for doing that. I, I think, and again, we can talk about this at the next meeting, but I mean, most of this noise abatement bylaw deals with private property. And there was the issue that Mr. Schlickman came back to town meeting at in 2018. And we had this issue of work being done on the public way. So the public way work almost became an exception to what where everywhere else almost exclusively applies to private property. And e even this exception only applies to public ways. It, it doesn't apply to work that would have to be done in a park, for example. It doesn't other public property, non-emergency work can't be done outside of ours. So most of this noise abatement statute applies to private property. It's just one section here that deals with public property. Um, and and I, so for that reason, I'm more comfortable with where it is. It's not perfect because you're trying to regulate two things, the noise on part, almost exclusively on private property but carve out this exception. And I'm okay with having an exception and having um, a procedure for the town manager to follow with DPW, even if it's in this part of the bylaw. It's people are gonna look for it within a noise abatement bylaw and I'm okay with it being here. But it's been a problem for years, Mr. Diggins, in terms of when, when this comes up, people are, are troubled. Okay, where does it go? Because we're trying to do a little bit more. I'd rather keep it where it is and work to improve the notice whether it's by the town manager's policy or whether we put some language in here. And I think that that to me is um, the best way to, to address the issue Mr. Schlickman raised. Right. Thank you, I appreciate it. Now, now I understand better. And right, repeat it, but thank I get you. it, thank and, you. Um, okay, so, so this is what I'm gonna do. Mr. Hurd's motion, if we're inclined to support Mr. Hurd's uh, most recent motion or, or his original motion, um, if that passes, then we don't have to deal with the other two tonight. If it's unsuccessful, then I will go to Mrs. Mahan's motion and to Mr. Helmuth. So we have a motion to continue this discussion or table this discussion 
until our meeting on March 21st. And that has been seconded by Mr. Diggins. Um, unless there's any further comments, I'll ask Attorney Hein for a vote. Um, no further comments. So Attorney Hein. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmer? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yeah. Mr. Corsi? Yes. It's an unanimous vote. Okay. All right. So we'll work in the meantime and, and put this on our agenda for the 21st. And um, it does increase the possibility of us meeting on the 23rd, but that's yeah. just what it is. Okay. So thank you, Mr. Schluckman. Um, you're uh, still going to be with us for a little while. And, and depending on how late we go here, if this on the, on the next three, if we're taking the same amount of time, we may stop after three and ask you to come back next week on the fourth one. But let's let's just see how we do. Um, so the next item is, I believe, is the code enforcement. Um, yes. So this is Article 20, code enforcement. Um, so if you could tell us a little bit about your article and, and what you're looking to do. We can't, um, you know, we can't hear you, Mr. Schlickman. Okay. I'm sorry. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes, we, yes, we can. Oh, great. Um, unfortunately, our bylaws have devolved into a compendium of municipal suggestions. There is a wide swath of uh, items, both within the uh, regular bylaws and the zoning bylaws that are unenforced. And if you recall in last year's town meeting, uh, when asked why the sign bylaws were not being enforced by the inspectional services, which is the designated uh, agency, um, the answer was pretty frank, is that that really isn't a priority. And if you sat through the town meetings over the past 10 years, and I know you have and have listened it, it, attentively, you know that on myriad of occasions, we've sort of pointed out across the street from town hall, uh, the general dental people have been in blatant violation of the sign bylaw, which says uh, signs should cover no more than 25% of your window area. There's a plethora of bylaws that go unenforced, and largely because the two agencies charged with enforcing them have other priorities. The police department wants to fight crime. The building inspectors and special services, they want to focus on issues of safety in terms of construction. Uh, so I decided to go look around to see who does this well and who has this well defined. And after an internet search, I landed on Fort Worth, Texas, uh, which divides up the tasks of code enforcement to one group of code enforcement that's done by the equivalent of our inspectional services that deals with uh, structural safety. And then you've got a second group that is the purvey, uh, in the purview of a code compliance officer, which has an entirely different mandate, sort of like the difference between police officers and parking enforcement agents. It's, it's a step down to where you don't need the technical skills, but you do need to have someone who can go out and look at a situation, be it an unshuffled sidewalk, a sign violation, things that are easy to uh, discern a violation of the bylaws and, and work to enforce it either through ticketing or through advising folks to, uh, to make an adjustment in, in what they're doing. Um, we, we've we've run through this so many times and there just isn't a structure and i'm very much aware of the uh, breadth of power of town meeting and what town meeting cannot do what i'm looking to do is provide the opportunity by tweaking the bylaw to place the existence of a code compliance officer into the bylaws so that in your wisdom and the wisdom of town meeting subsequently, a position could be created, a line item can be placed in the budget and somebody can do this work. It doesn't have to be a full-time job. And in fact, because this is a job that is operating within the domain of fees and fines, 
it shouldn't be at a cost of the town to provide the service, but there needs to be a reasonable way for us to go and see that the hours of debate in town meeting over bylaws result in the bylaw actually being enforced rather than it being an academic exercise. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schuckman. Uh, turn to the board, uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I am <clears throat> not inclined to support this um, purely on uh, the discussions. And I know I'm beating the drum to some of you here um, on, who have to sit listening to me to a long range planning committee. But um, in terms of one of the things I've been advocating for on the town side and, and recommending to the school side, but that's not my purview. So uh, the school side, so that's not anything we can do, but looking at a possible $15 million override um, that we've been discussing at Long Range Planning Committee um, and having A, to have that discussion and B, possibly to talk about an over operating override and what it will be. One of the things I wanna be able to do is demonstrate that, you know, uh, that we on the town side have done everything we can to um, try to make that number be reduced as much as possible. And one of the things I can point out is, you know, for the select board office, um, we're functioning with two full-time people when we're allocated, I think, four full and one part-time person. So we're down four and a half to five positions, but... Um, in mind of trying to really look at things and be very frugal with dollars, especially talking about an operating override. Um, I'm hesitant, not in favor of putting someone on, adding another position, adding benefits, longevity, retirement, sick time, et cetera. Um, I, I, I sympathize with Mr. Schluckman's points, and this does fall under um, inspectional services and, and or perhaps the planning department. I know in years past, um, Mr. McLennan, he was the person, the plan then planning director I would go to um, and he would take some action on uh, the gentle dental situation that Mr. Schlickman points out. But um, I think it's for the, um, my colleagues to discuss this, see where you all wanna go with it. But I'm just not in favor of just keep adding positions, adding positions, adding line items. You know, um, if you do that, what do you want to take away so that we can at least say we're breaking even? So uh, I'm not in favor of this. I'd like to hear what my colleagues have to say. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I tend to agree. I think I don't like the precedent of creating town positions through warrant articles. Um, I think we have a normal budget process where we identify needs in the town. And if this is, an, it's certainly a position or an enforcement officer of some sort is beneficial in this regard. I think it's something that can come up to, during the ne next budget process and we can weigh the need at that time. Um, but again, I don't, I just don't like the precedent of just creating positions in town through town meeting. And I think, I mean, we'll see what my colleagues say as well, but that would be my thoughts on this, this article. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, well, I think town council makes an argument for why, you know, this would ultimately have to be uh, HRP if I uh, home petition if I read it correctly, Eden. And and so um, through you, um, may I ask Mr. Heim if I did understand his his um, comment correctly? Attorney Heim. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Diggins. Uh, it depends. I, I think I think Jermaine, to what your colleagues are saying, it depends a little bit on the what exactly what action town meeting is taking if you town meeting could in theory add the position of code enforcement officer to 
Title IX of the town bylaws, but that position, to my knowledge, does not currently exist and is within the power of only the town manager to create that position. And then obviously town meeting uh, and the finance committee and the manager all go through the process of funding that position through the budget process. So you could put something in that authorizes this hypothetical code enforcement officer to conduct enforcement, but you can't um, force the town manager to create and staff that position. So I, I think that you're correct, Mr. Diggins, as, far, as are your colleagues, Mrs. Mahan and Mr. Hurd. Okay, thank you. And, um, so then um, my next question is to the town manager. And, um, through you, Mr. Chair, and, um, what do you think? Uh, Definitely. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would say similar to the comments from Mr. Hurd that um, the town has a long-standing budget process by which it considers needs as presented by uh, various departments, puts those into a budget proposal that's then considered by the finance committee and ultimately brought to town meeting. Um, I think there is a dangerous precedent in adding a position outside of that pretty regimented yet robust budget process. Um, I think if I think if there was a built agreement around the need for the addition of this position, it could be something that could be looked at in the next budget cycle. Um, but I think that um, people in my position can't speak for the finance co committee, but people serving on the finance committee have worked hard over the years to um, have the budget not grow on town meeting floor as to stay in conformance with the long range plan as Ms. Mahan was mentioning earlier. So um, through you, Mr. Chair, to the town manager, maybe to Mr. Slickman. So the assumption then is that this position could not pay for itself. So I would, again, Mr. Chairman, um, thank, thank you. Uh, I, I would uh, ask Attorney Heim to correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding for the most part, um, these fines would be related to, uh, or, or uh, they'd be fined under the section of the law called non criminal district non criminal disposition which is very hard to collect against um, we've experienced that in recent times with the board of health being able to issue fines for mask compliance violations and the fines exist um, but and actually i know attorney cunningham has been doing the uh, the the grunt work on this um, getting getting payment usually requires uh, filing in court um, which so this is not like a parking ticket where you know you're very highly likely to get that penalty paid. Um, you can certainly issue the penalties, but collecting them and actually counting on that revenue um, is a much different story. Okay, thank you. That was that was very helpful. That was very helpful because it, it didn't mean, because I remember Mr. Slickman when I was um, um, getting signatures to run for select board asked me about the whole notion of, I mean, why have bylaws if you don't enforce them? I mean, it made perfect sense to me that, well, well, you shouldn't. I mean, so I got into this position and talked with you more. It's like, well, there's this level of service, you know, um, um, concept. I mean, and so we can't we can't enforce everything because we just don't have I mean, the resources to do that. I mean, and so it almost begs, it almost tells you. I mean, when you see things that aren't being enforced, that maybe maybe they shouldn't be bylaws. You know, or maybe we should really think when we are creating bylaws. I mean whether or not it can be enforced. And if it can't be, then maybe we shouldn't make it a bylaw because I think it sets a bad tone for government, you know, to make something be findable, but then say you can't find it. Or you can find it, but then you can't collect it, you can't really enforce it. So 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 I just put that out there for us when we think about articles mean and and what kind of message we want to send to the public based on the our expectation of being able to enforce it. So I'm just gonna leave it at there for now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Mr. Helmut. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's been a good discussion. And, uh, you know, I think it, it's actually interesting that the town manager brings up the kind of contrast with the uh, with the fines that have been levied for mass compliance. And I, I've um, been involved in some of those discussions and I, you know, it's illuminating 
Um, and, you know, we do have to prioritize. And I think, you know, it's, it's helpful to know that it's been difficult to, to enforce and collect even something with, you know, that everyone would agree is an even higher priority than, than some of these other codes. Um, so I think that's a practical, you know, constraint. Um, and I think I have a sense for where the board's going. So, you know, uh, I also have some reservations about the mechanism. I think I have sympathy for, for, the, um, for the proponent and, um, I would, I'm just not sure it's the best way to get there, given the limitations of what town many can really do, and given the town manager's ability as enabled in the town manager act um, to really direct employees of the town and direct and create and, just, and, and eliminate departments, departments if they want to. Um, but I do have a question for the town manager through the chair, um, and that is if you could comment, Mr. Mr. Chaplain, on, on some of the context of uh, inspectional services position on uh, or, or capacity about inf enforcing some of the things that Mr. Schlickman's um, pointed out. Um, I mean, particularly maybe in the context of the last couple of years and, and in terms of staffing and in terms of new directions that the department's going and you know what, what you read on this. And I guess my question is, is there a way to, sometimes with these warrant articles, the, the best way to get a good result for the proponent isn't necessarily through a bylaw, um, but in this process to come up with um, a commitment, um, a policy direction from the board for the town manager if there is interest in capacity to, to do some of this on our own. So that's kind of the spirit of what I'm asking if Mr. Chaplin would like to, to comment on any of that. Uh, Mr. Chaplin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, so I, I think um, as the board knows, uh, last year, um, longtime uh, director of inspectional services, Mike Byrne decided to retire and we were fortunate to be able to promote uh, from within building inspector Mike Champa. And I think, you know, it, it's been from a capacity point of view, a challenging year for Mike Champa because Mike came from within, so then he needed to replace himself. So there's been workload capacity um, issues. Um, I know he's now close. Um, actually, I think, I think his replacement has officially started, if not starting very soon. And I think um, through conversations with Mike, I think we can make progress within our existing team on addressing some of the concerns that Mr. Schlichten has raised tonight, especially about the sign by law. Um, additionally, I know in the materials provided there were concerns expressed by Mr. Schlichten about uh, unshoveled sidewalks. Um, I'm very confident that the police department for years has done good work in trying to problem solve in that regard and when necessary issue fines. I think the, the most effective way to address that would be if we were able to effectively establish a lean and clean or clean and lean um, mm -hmm. approach, which is basically, I, I don't know if the board is familiar with that concept, but basically it's if someone has overgrown grass, that's a public health hazard, or in this case, snow, you can utilize uh, resource, uh, town resources, either contract or staff to, to do the work and then, and then lean them for the cost. Mm -hmm. We looked at that a number of years ago. In fact, might, I think it might even be enabled in the town bylaws, but we don't, we don't have the staff to do it. Um, I think, as we know, our, our, our folks work very hard um, to clean what's currently our responsibility in terms of snow. And when we put a contract out to bid, we weren't able to attract any outside vendors to do that type of work. So I'm not saying we couldn't look at that again, but we have looked at it in the past and it wasn't practically something we were able to tackle. So I, I think overall, I would say that there, there is room for us to start improving on performance that has been highlighted tonight, especially in terms of the signed bylaw within existing resources. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I, um, you know, I, I think we should try. <laughs> it's, it's um, I mean, I understand we have to prioritize, but, you know, and, and I think this makes me realize another another um, concern or, or, or just just constraint that even if we were to, even, even if Tommy I mean, could do more than Mr. Slickman knows that they can't, you know, and even if we created a code enforcement officer, we can write the tickets, but uh, not not having a mechanism to collect the fines except by taking people to court, which is a costly and, and resource intensive thing. We could be in a situation where we, have, we identify or hire a court code enforcement officer and we're not any better off than we are now other than people get a mild, you know, business owners might, might have a collection of pink slips um, that they have no intention of paying. And I think that's a real issue. And we learned this with mask compliance that it is not an easy thing to, to, to get enforced fines um, that, and by the way, I'm very grateful to Mr. Cunningham's efforts in that. I hope that they continue because that's really important. Um, so, you know, so I think I would uh, 
reluctantly support no action because I appreciate the spirit in which this is offered. And I, I would you know, encourage the town manager and his staff to, to look at what we can do, um, particularly with respect to the sign bylaw, because I think there's, you know, there's a good reason for those regulations. Um, so, um, you know, I'll leave it at that. I see some people have their hands up and I'll let the chair uh, sort those out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helms. Uh, Attorney Heim, did you want to respond to something? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'll try to be brief and mindful of the hour. I just want to make a couple things clear. One is the default penalty for a bylaw violation, feeding waterfowl, for example, is $20. So that, that also factors into it. There are other fines that are much bigger depending on what's happening. Things like building regulation fines tend to be bigger game if you've got a really big issue because those could be hundreds or thousands of dollars or even thousands of dollars and, and services does gain traction on that. It's also important to separate those things from zoning bylaw relief. So zoning bylaw is not generally oriented around fines and that is not something that can be accomplished by amending the town bylaws. It can only be accomplished by amending the zoning bylaws and making someone other than the building inspector the zoning enforcement officer. So one of the big issues that we have a lot of complaints about, uh, and this is just a complicated thing, is that uh, enforcement of zoning is not identical to enforcement of the town bylaws. The zoning bylaw has to be amended as a zoning bylaw in order to change who enforces the zoning bylaw. Right now, 99% of signs are in the zoning bylaw, just, just to be clear. And, and one of the reasons why the planning department is sometimes more involved in that is because it may be a violation of a special permit. So there are a bunch of different layers to this that um, sometimes involve injunctive relief or equity concerns and sometimes involve monetary ones. Sorry, thank you. Thank you, Attorney Ham. Uh, Mr. Hurd, did you want to add something? Or? Yeah, well, I just want to add generally to the discussion that my recollection is during COVID, we essentially instructed the town to not enforce the sign bylaw because we were trying to give latitude to businesses to provide information to cu customers about safety protocols and masking protocols and social distancing protocols. So I, I think it's probably, I don't remember if we had a sunset provision, but I think it's time to start reinforcing it. But I don't know if this board separately in a separate agenda item needs to address that or I just wanted to bring that up as in, because in the past couple, if the complaint is it that signed bylaws haven't been enforced in the past couple of years, it's partly because this board told the town not to enforce bylaws. And I don't recall if we specifically tailored it to um, COVID-19 related information, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Um, I have some comments, but Mr. Diggins, you put your hand up. So I don't know if you have a question. Or... Uh, it was just to briefly respond to Mr. Hurd. And I think, I think, I, mean, I think they have been sunsetted, but I mean, but we need to confirm, you know, I kind of recall in a meeting with Ms. Carter, I mean, that had come up and I thought um, I mean, we were back to our normal rules. That's it, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I, I have a few comments and I, and I want to thank Mr. Schlickman for bringing this up. I mean, these, these have been good discussions. At the end of the day, we may not uh, act favorably on what you're looking to do, but it certainly has been a, a, a good discussion. And I think we're trying to find ways to uh, to address these issues. And, and I look at this one on code enforcement that on the sign bylaw, notwithstanding what the former building inspector said, the building inspector has the authority to, to enforce the sign bylaw and to enforce the zoning bylaw and to order the removal of a sign. And I think uh, Mr. Champa hasn't had a full staff. There has been a lot of building permits um, that have been outstanding and work that needed to be inspected and, and approved. And, and so I think that goes to perhaps a budgetary issue for the inspectional services department, whether they need more resources going forward, particularly where they generate revenue through um, the issuance of building permits. But I, I'm comfortable that this is where um, we, we should keep this the, 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 the way we have it and not look to create a new enforcement officer. I, I do think on a couple of these ones that Mr. Schlickman uh, attached to his presentation and gentle dental, that wasn't a COVID related sign. I mean, clearly that is something, you know, perhaps we can put a request into inspectional services on that one. And, and even with uh, BB Liquors, um, 
um, that that clearly is something that they're, they're not complying with the, the signed by law. But I, I, I think it does raise questions, notwithstanding what the, you know, Mrs. Mahan raised very good points about the budgetary issues that we have. But I do think there are issues with inspectional services in terms of how big the staff is here and what they're they're doing what they can do given the amount of construction in town and given other things that we're asking them to do that maybe it's, um, let's see what happens now with full staff, but for next year, that may be a budgetary issue more than a creating a, a new position or, or, or amending the bylaw. So uh, uh, Mrs. Mahan, did you wanna add something? If this is the appropriate time, I'd like to move no action. Okay, um, thank you. And uh, do I have a second on that? Uh, a second, Mr. Mr. Chair. Was a, I think this is a public hearing, so we may need to uh, solicit yeah, comments. No, we will. Yeah. So I, right. I, I just wanted to, to, to get on with that. So as, as Mr. Allen said, this is a, a public hearing. Are there any members of the public that wish to be heard on this, Mr. Chaplain? No, there are not. Okay. All right. So um, any further comment from the board? Seeing none. Uh, on a motion for no action, uh, by uh, Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Helmuth. Attorney Hahn. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Uh, yes. It's unanimous. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so you know, we put a lot before you, Mr. Slickens. about 1020 now. We're gonna be coming back on the noise abatement matter. What I'm thinking, um, yeah, let, let, let's see where we go. I, I actually, I'll give you the option. Which one would you like to do next? Um, Megaliozzi Boulevard or budgetary impact of overnight parking? I, 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 without knowing what's in the minds of the select board, I think Maliazzi Boulevard is probably the easiest one. It's, it's proved to be very popular. From 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 the folks I've talked to. Okay. All right. Yep. So why don't so that is Article 19 and Article to for vote street name, um, Magliozzi Boulevard. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Schlickman. Well, first of all, uh, divorcing ourselves from the joyous part of this, uh, this is a public safety issue. Uh, we have an intersection and a stretch of roadway that. Some will say is accident prone, but there's no signs, no identification of where you are. So that if somebody from out of town ended up in an accident there and ended up dialing 911, they really not have much of a way to describe where they're at. So this little, this this very little but very wide street with a nice center divider, it's 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 a very 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 short boulevard. Really needs a name for public service purpose, uh, safety purposes. And the best name for this little roadway, this little boulevard is Maliazzi Boulevard. I mean, we, we have a statue for Uncle Sam, who was born here, but left at a very, very early age and never looked back. He packed his pork in Troy, New York. The Maliazzi's are beloved nationally, are both released the, these uh, both moved to Arlington. They chose to live in Arlington, and they both have sort of an Arlington attitude. I mean, don't drive like my brother. Uh, one Maliazzi lived on Jason Street, the other up in Precinct 13, using that as a cut through. So it really, there's really a spirit of the Maliazzi's that just is so well articulated by this little busy street. And think about it. Think about what a tribute it would be every time that your GPS decided to send you through this shortcut that it told you to turn right on Maliazzi Boulevard. We can have some fun here. It could be something the town could be really proud of, have a little fun with, and serve a public safety purpose as well. And I guarantee you, when town meeting gets hold of this, they're just going to have such fun with this, and they're going to be lining up the vote for this. So I hope that you join with everybody I've talked to on this one and say, yeah, this, that's a great idea. Let, let, let's vote favorable action. Uh, thank you, Mr. Schlickman. Um, turning to the board, Mr. Hurd.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm happy to support this. <laughs> it, it is a stretch of roadway. It doesn't have a name. And as Mr. Schlickman is the first person to come up and ask that we name it, I think he's the one that gets to choose the name. And since I did go to middle school with Drew Meliazzi, I think I'm inclined to support this, uh, this Warren article. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hurd. My apologies on the mispronunciation uh, earlier. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, mean, I, I, will, I will second it. I have a, a quick question for, um, for, for Mr. Schlickman. How'd you find this stretch of unnamed road? My, my friend, you are just as well versed at the town as I am, and we're all going out there doing doors and running for re-election and running for election and being civically involved. So I think that we all know every street in town, and we do know there's no way to describe this one. Um, it, it, it's just been sitting there for so long. I will say Arlington has good signs, but so many places in Boston you, you, or the Boston area, you don't know where you are. It, uh, uh, if you look, I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to support it. it, uh, it, it I, I do not own a car, uh, but even I know car talk, being have enjoyed listening to it a lot. It, uh, uh, and, and there's the one that laughs a lot, it, uh, and it's all jokes. It, and and uh, that's, that's me and boyfriend. I'm the one laughing at my own jokes, saying at least I humor myself. Uh, I do it pretty well, actually. But I will say you know, that um, uh, the, the, the attorney Heim does bring up an issue in his comments. I mean, that is that you know, this is something I think that the select board could do. I mean, I don't think it's the sort of thing that needs to go to, to town meeting. You know, I don't think, I mean, I'm, I'm not a big, the precedent thing doesn't bother me a whole lot in, in general because I feel that you can stop something anytime you really want to. Um, and so I'm inclined to, to go with it because I am looking forward to uh, a little more fun in town meeting, you know? So, so thank you for bringing it to our attention. Okay, th thank you, Mr. Diggins. Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. I listened to car talk long before I moved to Massachusetts 25, 30 years ago. Um, so I knew how to pronounce their names, but because I, I was a car talk nerd, I um, was delighted to learn the Arlington Connections when I moved here and to meet Ray uh, some number of years ago, delightful man. Um, so yeah, I support this. And uh, I also noticed that that boulevard doesn't have a name because um, I live in the neighborhood. Um, it'd be nice if the street sign that we put up there could have the phrase don't drive my like like my brother i think that you know that could be a good advisory uh safety advisory uh caution for people entering town <laughs> from route two um my question would just be to make sure that that i don't want to spoil town meetings fun on this because i think that we could use some uh but my question is would be to the town council i think through the chair uh if we kick this to town meeting can they legally legally name the street or do we need to do it and ask them to support it I'm going to turn this one over to Deputy Town Council Michael Cunningham, if that's okay. Mike, uh, of course, research on this particular uh, tough nut to crack. Oh, you guys were locked and loaded. Right. Hey, Mr. Oh, Mr. Chair, um, yeah, as as noted in the memo, there's no set procedure that we're able to locate for the naming, and I think it's debatable. Uh, I think there is a decent chance that the select board has the authority it needs to name it on its own. Um, however, you could, you could do that and, and seek town meeting support for it, however you really want to do it, because it, it's, it, the bylaws are silent on this, and I couldn't locate anything. There are some communities that have a set procedure. Um, the town of Arlington, is, to my knowledge, is not one of them. I think it, you, could, you could essentially do it either way, in my, in my view. Thank you. Um, so, um, so thank you both. I will move favorable action, and um, I, do not have, I don't have a preference on which way we do it. If we can, I think if we can do it, let town meeting name it. I say let them have all the fun. So <laughs> that's my motion. Okay. I, I, actually, thank you, Mr. Actually, Mr. Hurd had already moved. Ah, election. sorry. I didn't hear a motion. Well, then, then I'll defer his because I'm sure it's just as good. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and I second it if, if that's necessary. It's late. What can I say? I heard it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Boy, I feel like Mr. Scrooge. Um, <clears throat> I'm, well, I understand, you know, some may want to have a fun night at town meeting uh, talking about this. That's really not, 
I'm a very, like you all, I'm very process orientated. Um, this is, in my opinion, under the purview of the select board, number one. Number two, um, once we start doing this, I, there's probably 20 other places in Arlington that, you know, are similar to this that people will probably want to come in. I know we've had Arlington residents, Arlington town employees. I mean, Jimmy Dodge lives right there. Danny Kelly lives right there. I'd rather call it Kelly or Dodge um, Boulevard, but um, I'm not in favor of this because I think it, A, it's a select board decision. B, um, when we've had people come before us, most recently the Resendez family, um, as well as the Varnum family who live right on Freeman Street, um, when they've asked for um, memorials for their um, relatives who have done great things and lived in the town for 80, 90 years or whatever, um, we've directed them to our public memorial committee and indicated, you know, if you want to pay for a bench, do that. Um, so while I understand this particular piece of territory um, right now goes unnamed, um, right down by Danny Kelly and Kelly McCormick's house and MWRA pumping station as you go to get on Route 2. Um, I certainly am not in favor of sending something to town meeting just to have a, you know, ducks and giggles for a whole night because <laughs> I don't know that that's a good uh, use of everybody's time. Uh, if the board is so inclined and they want to take a vote amongst themselves, I would still vote no just because I'm thinking of other people that have come before us um, that have just as viable um, roots in the community, if not more. And we've directed them to a process that we've established, which is the Public Mor Memorials Committee. And then they have to fundraise for a bench, you know, along the bike path or up Robbins Farm. So um, I'm not in favor of this, uh, but I would, I guess I would say to my colleagues, if you are, and we should just do it as select board meeting. This should not be something so that town meeting can have fun for a night, especially where we lost about 52, 57 people um, who decided not to run for town meeting again um, when their seats opened up. And a lot of it was um, they felt like their time could be better spent. Um, and part of the reason not running for town meeting again um, was because they felt like some night or nights that wasn't the best use of their time. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, th thank you, Mrs. Mahan. And um, when I saw this article, I, I talked to the town manager about you know, what may have happened uh, in the past when there were requests for street names. And the one that he brought up to me was uh, Peg Spangler Way in front of the, the library. And so I went back and had taken a look at what the procedure was that was followed there. And, and there was a a Warren article, this is back in 2008, and um, the select board at the time, uh, when they had the Warren article, uh, referred it to the Public Memorials Committee, and the Public Memorials Committee indeed you know, made the recommendation that the library way should be changed to Peg Spangler Way, and I think the select board followed it, but what went to town meeting was a, um, a no action on a, on a bylaw that was to establish a committee or to honor uh, Margaret Spangler. So, I I come down in 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 on, on this one and as far as process goes. That um, I'm fine with referring it to the Public Memorials Committee, but I think that's that's the way. Um, given the board's the only precedent that I'm aware of, as opposed to sending it to town meeting. So, um, I I I guess I would uh, go along with Mrs. Mahan on a on a vote of no action but with a referral to the Memorials um, Committee on, on, on this request. So um, we do have a motion that was made and seconded, uh, motion by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Diggins. I haven't heard from the public yet, so let, let me open that up, Mr. Chaplin, if there's any, but any members of the public that wish to be heard. There are not. Okay, all right. Uh, and unless there are any further board comments, we can bring it to a vote. Okay. Uh, seeing that. So on a motion for favorable action by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Diggins, Attorney Hine. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmer. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. No. 
Mr. DeCourcy. No. It's a three, two vote. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so that brings us to the last, just check the time. Okay, we still have some time left. Um, the last Warren article hearing this evening is article 22 um, for a vote to establish town committee to examine budgetary impact of overnight parking. Um, Mr. Schlickman, um, if you could uh, let us know what you're, you're proposing there. You know, the thing is uh, that technology has changed, the world has changed since we established an overnight parking ban. And, and I'm not in any way advocating that we get rid of it. Uh, but it seems obvious that we could think about how we administer it and enforce it. Uh, over the past few years, the town has now gotten into parking apps so that there is a fee for service uh, to use the app rather than a parking meter to pay for parking. It's possible that we might want to use this sort of methodology for paying for uh, certain overnight parking. Uh, there is an expense to administering this. There is an expense to uh, there, there is uh, revenue that could possibly be gained from a permitting process. In fact, we do gain revenue from parking permits elsewhere. Uh, and we do have an equity issue in terms of, of enforcement, because right now the way we enforce the parking ban is very difficult. We have a two-hour parking restriction between the hours of 1 a.m. and 7 a.m. So that anyone who's enforcing this needs to see the parked car twice in a period that's more than two hours. So you can't just look at a car on the street and determine, well, this one's in violation, this one isn't. Um, there are ways we can think about this to make it more efficient, more equitable, so that if you don't like your neighbor, you're calling all the cops every night and he's getting blasted with tickets, but your friend down the street never gets a, gets a ticket or rarely does. Equity, fairness, efficiency. Let's, let's just look at the way we're doing it. So let's get the parking clerk. Let's get the uh, somebody from the uh, police enforcement, get a couple of town meeting to get uh, members together. Um, Get people who are thoughtful on this to think about the the expenditures to enforce this, the revenues we could be collecting, and, and how we want to structure this in the context of the technology we have in the 21st century. That's that's the thinking behind this. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Schlickman. Um, and to the board, uh, Mr. Diggins. Hmm. Well... <laughs> I see where you're coming from on this, it, um, and uh, it. Given that this is under the control of the select board, and given that I know that we are working on this issue, a, a question is whether or not we can work on the pilot that we have in mind, mean and do this study at the same time and whether it'd be worth it to do it at the same time given the, the nature of the pilot that we have in mind and um so i'm tempted to well i'll tell you what um, i'm not sure where i'm gonna head on this because i really want to hear what the chair um has mm -hmm. to say about this so if the chair wants to respond now uh to my thinking i think he knows where i'm going um he can respond now otherwise i'll just wait until he you know, um, mm -hmm. speaks questions and then make a decision. That's it, thank you. Yeah, th th thank you, Mr. Diggins. I, I think what I'll do is I'll go through the board. I, I do have comments on it, but just in, in terms of the procedure that I've, I, I've, I've laid out there, but I, I, I guess I, I'll give you a little preview that uh, I, I favor going the pilot route as opposed to this committee route, but I'll, I'll elaborate on that a little bit more as we as we go on. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Helmer. Uh, thank you. Um, I think um, yeah, I, I share a concern uh, about working across purposes here. Um, and they, you know, given that this is the board's um, domain, 
uh, which no one's disputing, of course. I mean, this would be an advisory uh, process. You know, and we could, if I think if the board decided that it wanted to investigate um, the economics of a program like this using this technology, we've talked about doing that. Um, and we could, we could direct the town manager to just to just do it. Um, um, so, you know, and certainly no one's arguing that we need a town a, a body of town meeting to do that. But I think there's something to be said for um, appreciating the, the um, domains of what town meeting does and what town select board does. And this is one of these areas where it's very clearly, clearly you know, in select board's policy and domain to, to deal with parking and traffic. Um, so I think you know there's a lot of room for a process for for resident advocacy, political advocacy, to ask us to contemplate doing this. Um, so I think you know one question I might have is is one of capacity uh, through the, through the chair to the town manager, which would be um, you know I know that I mean this proposal just been roughed out um, in general terms by the proponent, which is fine. But you know, if you understand, if you sufficiently understand kind of the objectives of this, do you have a sense for scope of this and, and what feasibility should should the select board ask the town manager's office to orchestrate a study like this? Kind of what that looks like feasibility wise and, and amount of work wise. The chat on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, Mr. Helmuth, I would say um, I, I definitely learned more listening to the proponent tonight about the breadth and scope of what he was looking to seek. Um, and, and it was a little more than what I maybe thought was being sought coming into tonight's meeting. But that being said, I'm not sure that a new body needs to be created or whether or not this could be referred to the Parking Advisory Committee to be mm -hmm. better coordinated in conjunction with the pilot that the board is already contemplating. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there, I said another way, you know, there already are, there already is a group with sort of cross-cutting both staff with specific practical expertise and resident stakeholders thinking about parking issues. Um, I haven't asked that group about their interest in looking at this, but I do think from a technology perspective uh, and an understanding of the town's parking challenges perspective, they could be an already existing body to consider being asked to do this work. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, you know, and once again, I think it, it can be, these hearings can be useful as a way of saying, What's the best way to get to the objective here? If we're interested in this question, the select board has to be interested in asking the question. Tell me, sits up the committee, they cannot compel the select board to contemplate the solution. Um, if the select board wants to do it, um, I, I think it's a creative idea. And you know, do we need a bylaw to do this, or or you know, is this the right way to do it? So I'm skeptical, but I, I want to hear the rest of, uh, of my colleagues and what the public has to say as well. Um, but why is I'm skeptical? I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I actually kind of like the idea. If we were to maintain, I mean, we're, we're, we're going to be discussing now a pilot for, for some modifications to the program. If we were to maintain the prohibition, I'm actually pretty interested in what Mr. Slickman's proposing um, for looking at the enforcement because in my short time on the board has been pretty clear that it's, you know, there are, there are equity issues with it for sure. Um, so I'm sympathetic to the objectives. My question is um, the best way to do it, uh, particularly given that it's our domain and we're thinking about doing, um, a, investigating a different course right now. Okay, I'm done, thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is sort of yet another thing. Um, and look to my colleague on the school committee. I know if we, I came into town meeting and said I wanted to add teachers and teachers aides and set up committees on uh, special education funding and having personally experienced it and uh, really gotten not even no end of the stick, but the short end of the stick. Um, that wouldn't be the route I take. So I feel like I've kind of been a Debbie Downer on a lot of these things. But again, this is um, similar to the previous Warren article. <clears throat> um, it's something that the select board oversees. Um, my colleagues have already made those comments. I am not going to make a motion because I feel like I've sort of been the only one batting things down on poor Mr. Schlickman, and I have a lot of respect for him. Um, but um, I think the board is discussing this. We have the framework, if not the committee, that will take the next step to look at it. So I'm not um, going to make a motion on it. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, thank you, Ms. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Hurd. No, trying to reiterate the points that have been made. Uh, I'll make a motion of no action for the reason that we have been taking on this issue for the past couple of years. We've had a number of inquiries by the residents and as a result has been discussed we have we are starting to implement a pilot program to see what the practical impacts would be of listing of lifting the overnight pa parking ban so that is already in process and i think as part of our i mean the, the warren article is specific to the financial impacts but i think if we created this committee then in addition to the financial impacts, the committee would look at the practical impacts, which we're already looking at through our pilot program and you get to a point where you have competing recommendations, whereas we are going to look at, we'll have the pilot program, we're going to look at the data, we're going to talk to residents, we're going to look at what the results were and formulate where we go from there, whether it be further pilot programs or ultimately another town-wide ballot question. So I think we're already in process for what this committee would accomplish. And as Mr. Chaplain said, I think the financial aspects of having or not having the overnight parking ban are best suited to be uh, handled by town staff who would look at the, the financial impacts of the overnight parking ban and then advise us as a board, whether it be through the parking parking committee, sorry, Mr. Chaplain, I, I always want to say parking implementation governance committee. I, forget, I always forget what we renamed it to, parking advisory committee. Um, but I think town staff can handle the financial aspects, and that's who we trust most to to advise us in that area. And like I said, since it's already in process, I think it would be redundant and. Hmm. We don't need so many town meeting committees that I think it, the point is well taken by Mr. Schlickman. Mm -hmm. I think the response is that we are in process of looking at the impacts of the overnight parking ban and we have recommendations forthcoming mm -hmm. in the very near future. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. I, I have some comments, but before I do that, is there a second for Mr. Hurd's motion of no action? Okay, second by Mr. I Diggins. Okay. Um, yes, I, I appreciate the the article, but and it I Mr. Diggins and I are are working on a proposal, and and uh, you know it's and, and I put it on myself as as much as anything. Like we want to come back to the board with a proposal and and talk about a pilot, and, and unfortunately we haven't been able to do that yet. And it's more on me than Mr. Diggins. He um, we have met with some um, town meeting members and and. Uh, in, in East Arlington and we may expand that a little bit and may come back to the board, but this is something clearly that we wanna bring back to the board on the, on the pilot basis for consideration. And there's no question there are equity issues that um, mm -hmm. that, that need to be addressed here. Um, I think if, if a year from now we were still going to continue with overnight parking and, and, and we may, that it may make sense to create a committee with some of these objectives, but I think it should be a committee created by the select board as opposed to the town meeting. So I think all of these issues are, are, um, are relevant, but I, I, I think um, mm -hmm. I'm hoping as a board, we actually move forward uh, in the short term to do some things, to get some data and to, to make some decisions over the next year. So for that reason, I'd be inclined not to support this uh, mm -hmm. either, but, uh, but appreciate the, um, the commentary and, and, and what's being looked for here. Um, it is a public hearing, so I want to open it up if there's any public comments on, on this that uh, anybody wishes to make. Okay. No, uh, no, there are no hands raised. No hands. Okay. So we have a motion of no action uh, by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Diggins. Any further comments from the board? I'll, I will just note, Mr. Chairman, that Mr. Schlickman has his hand raised. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Schlickman. Yep, go, go right ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, no, I definitely do respect uh, where the board is right now and and your decision to move no action on this if you're going in a parallel direction. Um, ju just, just as a point of clarification, if I may, um, as a school committee member, I, I note that uh, the town meeting has authority only to approve or amend 
the line item of schools. But town me meeting has power to amend any line item elsewhere in the budget so that parking enforcement agents, fine revenues, these things in the financial sense are relative to the the, the work of town meeting. Uh, town meeting is the budgetary, uh, the appropriating authority. So I've been very careful in writing my articles to confine myself to the points in which town meeting may have a voice and respecting the uh, role of the select board to do their work as defined under the town manager act and in mass general laws thank you okay no no thank you mr schlickman um all right uh, so with that i uh don't see any other hands raised by board members uh, on a motion of no action by mr hurd seconded by mr diggins attorney Hunt. mr hurd yes mr diggins yes Mr. Helmer? Yes. Mrs. Ma. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Unanimous vote. Okay, thank you. And then thank you, Mr. Schlickman, that that was four Warren articles. That was a long <laughs> night. We appreciate your participation tonight. I love you guys. I'm very happy to uh, spend the evening with you and uh, <laughs> wish you nothing but good things. And good luck on your reelection efforts, Mr. DeCourcy. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, Me too, Paul. Bye. Okay. That concludes the Warren article hearings. We have one item left, final votes and comments. Um, there are five articles um, that Attorney Heim and Attorney Cunningham provided comments to us on. Um, unless there are questions, I think there may be a couple of comments on, on this. I mean, we can vote on this tonight or we can table to, to the next meeting, but uh, I'll start with uh, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the good work uh, on the part of our legal department, as always. Um, I'd like to uh, ask my colleagues, uh, at least with respect to the Police Civilian Advisory Commission, to table at least that item um, to our next meeting. And nothing big going on, but I've been working on um, a couple of ideas for refined language, nothing that would touch our decisions from the last meeting. Um, and I'm in some conversations with people on the committee and our uh, DEI coordinator. And um, just in some of our language, um, I think there might be some opportunities for some clarity that, that we could have some consensus about. So um, if you would indulge me, I could come back come back with some detail on that at our next meeting. Um, okay. Other than that, I have no comments on the other votes. Okay, um, so do, do we have a second on Mr. Helmuth's motion? I'll second it. Ended by Mr. Diggins. And, um, we, and I'll just add, we, I'm not sure quite what Mr. Helmuth has in mind, but certainly, uh, my issue with um, that um, article was that I felt that we needed to tell more of the story about um, our deliberations. So uh, that was going to be my request. Okay. All right. Um, thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Diggins. So the, the remaining Warren articles, um, I don't know if there are any comments or anybody has any issues with them. That is on the, the resolution in support of the fair share amendment the bylaw amendment for tree preservation and protection and the resolution regarding Alife Brook. And I, I said five, I believe it's only four that were um, before us tonight. So any further, and before I do that, I see Attorney Heim's hand up. So Attorney Heim. Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy, I apologize. I just wanted to note that the Save the Alife Brook folks contacted me and they, Ms., Mrs., Ms. Anderson and Mr. White and ask that in that last um, part of the vote, further that town meeting also resolves to encourage and support all town officials in engaging the MWRA. They'd like to uh, add um, DCR to that list of entities. Uh, they were overall very pleased with the, um, with the uh, vote and comment, and they were hoping that you would agree to add DCR to the resolution language. Thank you. Okay, that's the last part. So yeah, I'll take that as a friendly um, administrator, a friendly addition to, to, to be included with, as you said, Attorney Heim, MWRA, Cambridge, and Somerville. Um, so if members are so inclined, if we vote on the other three, the vote on Alewife would include the addition of DC, DCR. So 
Um, any comments from members, members' questions? So we have a motion to table. Um, Attorney Hahn, should we be, we should also be taking a motion. I don't know if you want us to do it individually on the other, on the other ones, or if we can just take one motion to approve the, the votes and comments on the other ones. Unless board members want to break them out, um, you can vote them on, on them as slate. You, you may break them out if you wish, but you can vote on them as a slate. Okay, so if, if a board member is comfortable, I did look for a motion to approve the other uh, articles. Um, Chairman, can I just ask um, the Human Rights Commission bylaw? Are we also tabling that or are we oh. voting that? Okay, that that's make one I that was the fifth one. So that, that <laughs> thank you, Mrs. Mahan. I skipped the, um, right, is that, that one was in your memo, Attorney Heim, is that right? No, I'm, I'm working on it. It's oh, okay, just, all right. Thank okay, you for that's what so we had five and that's why four are back before us. So sorry with the, uh, the, the, the late hour. So that will be before us in a future meeting. All right, move approval of the uh, bylaw amendment tree preservation protection uh, resolution, mass fair share resolution L. White Brook with the friendly amendment that the chairman outlined. Okay, and okay. do we have a second on that? Okay, then it's seconded by Mr. Hurd. Okay, so we'll have two votes. Um, and why don't we take any other comments from board members? No, seeing none. Okay, so why don't we take the motion to table um, the Police Advisory Commission uh, Warren article that was made by Mr. Helmuth, and I believe it was seconded. Uh, was it Mr. Diggins who seconded that? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, Attorney Hunt. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mr. Mon. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Corsi. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Great, thank you. And then on a motion on the remaining items in Attorney Heim, remaining articles in Attorney Heim's, uh, in Attorney Cunningham's memorandum motion um, to approve by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmut? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Shannon's vote? Okay. That brings us with four minutes to spare to new business. Um, uh, Mr. Dean, before new business, did you want to say something, Mr. Diggins? Before yes, new yes, yes, I do. You know, and so I, I know in town meeting, when you're on the winning side of a vote, you can uh, request reconsideration. I'm kind of wondering, you know, so we're going to bring things back for a final vote. You know, at that point, we can, we can reconsider our votes on things. Yes. Okay. Fine. Next right. week. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. So on to new business. Uh, Attorney Hine. Uh, I have no new business. I just, if, if folks want to provide me any feedback they have on the comments, I, 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 I always welcome them. Please feel free to write me about that. Um, so I'll wait to hear from folks. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chapdelaine. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think I took my share of new business at the start of the meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Helen? Uh, thank you, just just very briefly, um, and I, I, I've worked with it, I heard from the chair on this, but since I brought up a new business last week that we uh, intended to, or wanted, wanted to recognize the uh, personnel from, from the uh, Board of Health office, um, that we we're gonna do that tonight, but we got a full docket. So I think the intention is to do that um, very soon, perhaps at, our, perhaps at our next meeting to, to recognize them for the sacrifices and extra work that they've done um, during the pandemic. So, thank, still, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Um, Mr. Diggins. No new business, thank you. Mr. Hurd. Well, I do, do want to say, Mr. Diggins, that I actually have switched my vote on final votes and comments, so there is precedent for it. Um, I just wanted to congratulate the AHS boys and girls hockey teams for big first round wins over the weekend. And then the boys are playing tomorrow and the girls on Wednesday at the Ed Burns Arena. I've never seen so many people at the Ed Burns Arena in all my years of going there. So I think it'll be even more packed in the next couple of days. And the girls team includes a couple of very talented relatives, our, our own Ms. Kropelka. So stay tuned. And they, uh, but you could see championships on with both teams in the horizon. Thank, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, going to assume maybe under new business or the next meeting, um, you'll have some outline concerning the town manager um, search process. Um, I'll make this short and sweet. Um, I, I respect the manager for his decision uh, for himself, his family, in his career. Um, it will come as no secret that uh, certainly had wanted to wait until the manager's contract was up, but uh, obviously honored as my colleagues did his request to expedite the process and do it by December. I just want to say, you know, and I know this is something he thought about, um, as you told me, for a while. Um, I certainly would have appreciated knowing that sooner. Um, cause I, I just want to, I'm not sure how you all are getting it, but 11 days into a brand new contract, um, where there were requests to have increases and we did approve that, although we did not on the sick leave buyback, thank goodness. Um, uh, but it is what it is. Uh, and I just want to, whether the chairman speaks it tonight or the new business or the next meeting that we, um, know what needs to be done to, to, to get the process started that we probably could have started back in November, December, but um, we're definitely, you know, taking the bull by the horns and, and moving forward on it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. So I, I have a few things and I'll try to be brief um, on this. First of all, um, I, I mentioned earlier in the meeting, there are a few Warren articles that the ARB will have primary motion on that they've asked us for input and they will be articles, articles 30, article 28 and article 38 dealing with solar energy, enhanced business districts and the two family um, homes being allowed as of right in the R0 and R1 districts. Again, we don't have to take an action on it, but those are three that they requested or through their chair requested of us. And um, I'll have more information on that for a subsequent meeting. I do want to let the board know and the public know that I have been working with Karen Malloy um, for requests, working on requests for quotations for a search firm for the um, for, for the town manager search. And I will come back to the board and put it on for a future meeting and update the board on that. But um, in talking to her, we did feel like it, it was important to start that process because that, that, that will, um, we'll be moving forward on that. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, Mr. Hurd mentioned that I did want to mention both the boys and girls hockey teams, those games tomorrow night at six is the boys Wednesday night at six is the girls hockey team. Last thing, um, I wanted to say, and, and just to wish luck to two former Arlington high basketball players, um, Colin McNamara at Worcester Polytech and Don Black, who goes to RPI, they, um, in the division three national tournament. They both teams made it to the Sweet 16 and they're playing each other on Friday at 4.30. Unfortunately, it's in a regional that's in Virginia. They have to travel down, so there's no local access, but uh, you know both families. I've known Colin and Dom and uh, I wish them both well. And it's it's a great, uh, they're both in their last year in, in college. They played under John Bowler at Arlington High and um, to see them get this far and, and to be competing is, is a really great accomplishment. So. Good luck to both of them and to um, to our, our hockey team still in the tournament. So with that, I will um, take a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Okay. Uh, motion to adjourn made by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Diggins. Attorney Hine. Sure. Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmer? Yes. Ma? Yes. Mr. DeCourse? Yes. Janice Pope? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. And everybody.